well. Keep up and. Looks like we have all of our commissioners here, and uh, looks like we're live. And um, <coughs> don't yet have Brady. It looks like. But maybe we'll get maybe we'll get started here. I'm sure Brady will be joining us shortly. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, regular meeting of the Cook County Board of Commissioners on Tuesday, March 9th at 8:31 a.m. Call this meeting to order, and please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to this republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Does anyone have uh, any amendments or adjustments to the agenda? I don't see or hear any, but um, Attorney Hicken, you had mentioned a potential time conflict, and so I would propose um, we make an, uh, an adjustment there. Um, my proposal would be to um, move our open meeting law um, review up um, to just after emergency operations command update, so just after item four. Um, does anyone have um, issue with that? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, sure. Thank you for for letting us know about potential conflicts. Um, well, with that um, adjustment, I would entertain a motion to <clears throat> approve the agenda. Commissioner Sullivan. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the agenda with the adjustment. Thank you. Motion second. Sullivan. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Hawkins. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Um, we have our approved agenda here. Um, Moving on to public comment period. Um, Mr. Yorkie, have you received any, any public comment or has anyone else uh, received anything that citizens would like us to share? Mr. Chairman, I've not received any comments. Okay. I don't hear or see any from anyone else, so um, we can move on. <coughs> Item three is the consent agenda. Um, does anyone have uh, an item they'd like to pull from the consent agenda? Commissioner Hawkins? I would like to uh, discuss further item 3E. Okay. Any other items from anyone? Hearing or seeing none. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda minus uh, 3E. I will make that motion, Commissioner Hawkins. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Paulson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Swalson. Roll call vote. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is I as well. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Hawkins, I guess we didn't uh, identify where to put 3E, but um, we can probably put that down under human resources if that's all right with you. Yep. 
Very good. Um, moving on to item four is the Emergency Operations Command update. We have uh, both uh, Grace and Mike with us this morning. Um, Grace, would you like to start, please? Sure, I am happy to. Um, so I'll start with our case counts. We are at 121 cases. We did have three cases come in over the weekend. Um, and so we are still completing the case investigation contact tracing for the two that came in yesterday. Um, and the third is already complete. So we do have some new cases coming in. In terms of vaccination statistics, um, we are at, let's see, at this point as a county, 2,374 people have had at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and 1,734 people have completed the two dose vaccination series. In the target 65 and older population, 1,331 people have had at least one dose and the majority of those have had both, although I can't break the number down that way. Um, that equates to 91% of people ages 65 and older who've had at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, which is significant. Um, that's the state's priority group. Um, and that is because that group is accounts for 80% of the hospitalizations due to COVID-19. So that is the reason the state was focusing and prioritizing on vaccinating 65 and older, very, very um, close to the beginning of mass vaccination. So that's great. Um, this week, we have one vaccination event at the community center on the 11th, which is Thursday. Um, it is a mix of second doses and first doses. We have 300 people due for their second dose of the vaccine. That includes largely that 65 and older population is that 300. Uh, and at 100 people who are receiving their first dose this week on Thursday. This week, the eligibility uh, criteria, anyone from 1A, that healthcare worker, long-term care resident group continues to be eligible as do um, childcare and K-12 educators, as well as people over the age of 65. The newly eligible group this week is patients of Sawtooth Mountain Clinic ages 55 to 64 with either an underlying health condition or a social stressor. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more why that specific group for eligibility. So um, as I've said before, the state of Minnesota sets the eligibility criteria for vaccination. Um, we in Cook County are in a unique position because both the County Public Health Department and the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic are working together on mass vaccination. Um, and so there are two different streams of being able to receive vaccine and the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic as a community health center has um, permission from the state of Minnesota to vaccinate its patients in that expanded age and eligibility group. So, um, we tried working with um, Kyle Oberg and GIS to create a eligibility kind of screening tool to help people understand whether they would be eligible or not. It seems to be working well. I haven't gotten uh, people contacting me saying that it is not working well or that they're feeling confused. So that seems like a good sign. Um, basically when we open registration Mondays at 8 a.m. on the hub website, there is a button you can click to say register here and it'll walk you through a series of questions to see if you're eligible. So it'll ask if you're 65 or older. Um, if you click no, it'll ask if you're a clinic patient. If you say yes, it'll drop down to additional questions and information about underlying health conditions and social stressors. So um, if you click yes to one of those and you're in the age range, you, you follow the link to register. And that event for Thursday is now full. It filled last night. So um, it's a huge benefit to have the County Public Health Department and the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic working together because we're able to support one another at the actual events and in the outreach and registration process, but we're also able to access vaccine through the state through two different avenues, which has 
um, allowed us to move forward in that expanded eligibility group uh, through the clinic and their status as a community health center. Um, I am expecting, um, in terms of who's next, who's next in the priority list, at this point, um, we're anticipating being able to drop the age um, of the clinic patients with underlying conditions or social stressors next week um, down to 50. We're also um, expecting to be able to move into the food processor category, which the state set out for the next eligible group, which is a rather small population in Cook County. Um, but that is the next group that's up for eligibility. The governor today will be making an announcement about the groups that will be eligible next and what the timeline is for that. So I'm going to be watching that announcement closely. It's expected to happen this morning. So, you know, things continue to change very rapidly in the world of vaccine eligibility and vaccine uh, news overall. Um, of course, the exciting news, you know, not not even two weeks ago now is that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine was given emergency use authorization. At this point, we're still expecting that we'll continue to receive the Moderna vaccine. That could change, but for now, that's what we're expecting. That's what we've been. Uh, that's what the state has indicated to us. Their um, allotment of Johnson and Johnson went largely to communities that had not yet vaccinated 70% of 65 and older population. Um, the other really significant news that came out yesterday is that the CDC updated their guidance on when people have been fully vaccinated, what they, what they can do safely. Um, so people are considered to be fully vaccinated two weeks after they've received um, the full series of the vaccine. So for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's only one dose. For both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, that's two weeks after their second dose because they're both a two-dose series. So um, the news from the CDC basically said if you have been fully vaccinated, you can get together indoors with other people who are fully vaccinated without wearing a mask. You can gather indoors with people who are not fully vaccinated from one other household without masks, unless any of the people who are unvaccinated, um, any of the people at all, or anyone they live with has a higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Um, also, if you're fully vaccinated, with an exception for healthcare workers, if you're fully vaccinated and you are exposed, in other words, you're a contact of someone who tests positive for COVID-19, um, you do not need to quarantine or get tested unless um, you live in a, a group setting like a correctional facility or a group home. Um, and so that is in those situations, they still recommend quarantine and testing. So they still, even with this new guidance, they still really emphasize that you should still wear a mask in public, you should still socially distance, you should still avoid crowds and avoid spaces that are poorly ventilated. Um, you still should not get together with people who are not vaccinated from multiple other households and or visit with people who are unvaccinated and at higher risk for complications from COVID. There's still a recommendation to avoid large and medium gather sized gatherings, to avoid unnecessary travel, and to still be very vigilant when it comes to watching for symptoms. The vaccines work very, very well, but nothing is 100%. And so if someone who is vaccinated feels that they have symptoms that could be COVID, they still recommend testing in those situations. So this is going to um, be a huge effort for us in public health in terms of education to the community and messaging. Like I said, it came out yesterday, so we haven't really made a lot of headway in that yet, but it was very exciting to see those updated recommendations coming out of the CDC. Other um, notable news the ISD 166 last week brought back middle school students for a hybrid, and this week brought high school students back for hybrid. They still have an option for distance. One um, related public health initiative is to help families know about the governor's recommendation that students um, 
do surveillance testing every two weeks for COVID. Um, I think with all that's going on, it's kind of an easy recommendation to miss. And also it's something that would require families to use that mail-in saliva test program through Vault. And so we're wanting to make sure that people know how to access that. It is free, um, but you do have to go online and request the test kit and then um, do the, the Zoom call telehealth visit. Um, and return the kit. So there are some steps involved. And really, I think our role in public health is to just make sure people know that that avenue is open and to help people figure out how to use it. Um, we don't have the capability of doing that surveillance testing locally. We just, we couldn't accommodate that many people through the local clinic and lab for testing that, that we're talking, you know, a couple hundred people every two weeks. And that's pretty significant for our local system. We just don't have that um, ability, but the, we do have this mail and saliva program. So I think the first step is to just let people know that it's there and to help them figure out how to use it. Um, and then finally, a lot of exciting news, but there is some concerning news on the horizon. The um, B117 variant of COVID-19, it's sometimes called the UK variant. Um, it is in Minnesota and they have identified as of Friday last week, an outbreak with the variant in Carver County, largely related to youth sports. Um, so they had some recommendations specific to Carver County to try to control the outbreak there. But um, I think it's just a good reminder to everyone that even though we have a lot of exciting news on the horizon with these new CDC recommendations for people who are fully vaccinated and really promising numbers with um, our local vaccination campaign, we still all have to stay vigilant and remember that there is still COVID circulating in the community and in the state. Um, and so it's just really important to keep, keep it up with the, the safety precautions, even though it is a challenge, especially after a year. Um, one of the major points of concern with this variant is that it spreads more easily between people. So it spreads the same way as um, the, the earlier um, variants that we had circulating, but this one seems to be more infectious. So that's just uh, a good reminder and good um, motivator to, to stay careful and be careful uh, in the coming weeks as we try to continue to roll out vaccination um, as quickly as we're able. So that is my update. Lots going on in the world of public health here. So happy to take questions from the commissioners. Thank you, Grace. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for Grace? Chairman Mills? Uh, yes, um, Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Well, Grace, it was nice that MPR did a, a really good coverage of our work up here. And I think that um, they and other people are curious in the state as to how we're doing it. And so um, I appreciate, you know, everything that you're doing in the Sawtooth Clinic and all of that, because um, it, is, uh, it is quite an uh, achievement and it's quite an endeavor to uh, be as organized as you have been. So uh, much appreciation for all that you do. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. I did not mention the NPR article. It's, it feels like it was a long time ago, but it was just a week ago at this point. Right. Yes, it was a fantastic story. And I, I think it really did a nice job at highlighting our really dedicated and fantastic volunteer base. We I can't say enough about the Minnesota Response volunteers and how, mm. how integral they've been to helping us respond. So, so thank you. Um, Commissioner Hawkins, you had a question as well. Yeah, thank you, Grace. I'm really excited about the vaccination numbers. And I just wanted to report, I know a few weeks ago, I said my mother had problems with the registration process, but my friend was able to register yesterday, no problems, went smoothly, got an appointment, we're very excited. So thank you for that. I do have a question about um, healthcare and school workers and I understand it's it's a choice to get vaccinated. Do we have any idea what the percentage is of people who've chosen so far to get vaccinated? You know, that's it's a good question. I think that specifically for healthcare, 
I know that those would be numbers that um, the the administrators like like Kimber at North Shore Health and Kate at Sawtooth Mountain Clinic would likely have access to. And I'm not sure if that is something that the school administrators are keeping on hand for their staff. Um, I think anecdotally, I can say that it's been pretty high. I'm not keeping track of all of the um, specific numbers, but one thing that I will note as just a general trend, which has been exciting for me, is that we are seeing now people who were maybe on the fence at first now saying, oh, I, I guess I, you know, I've decided that I will sign up. I'm feeling more comfortable with things. And that feels, uh, that feels good. Um, we're always able to answer questions that people had have about the vaccine um, and just really want to make sure people feel like they have that ability to get their questions answered um, respectfully and also have access to the vaccine when they become eligible. So, and I'm glad to hear that uh, your friend had no trouble registering. Looking forward to seeing them on Thursday. All right, thank you. Um, so I lost my internet connection. I'm still here on the phone line, but that just means I can't see anyone. So if you would like to uh, ask a question or a comment, please just state your name and then I can um, address you. So does anyone else have any questions or comments? Uh, Chairman Mills, this is James. Yes, Administrator Yorkie. Yes, um, Grace, I, first of all, thanks for a great report. And it is super exciting that we're getting so many folks vaccinated. That's just the best news for this community. Um, I asked you last week, I, I know with the, with the new B117 variant, um, you said they are doing random checks on samples that are coming in to see if, if any of those samples contain that variant. And I'm wondering now that the presence of, of the variant is, is established here in the state, uh, any signals from MDH that they're going to be changing that protocol to test more more cases or more samples? And the reason I ask that is, you know, we have three new cases in the last several days, and I'm wondering, do we need to be concerned that that variant might be here in Cook County? I would say um, I. I haven't heard a new report from the state. I would assume that because of the outbreak in Carver County, they are very likely doing much, much more sequencing in Carver County with the outbreak. Um, and I would say locally, because it's a randomized sample, I don't think that there's any way we are going to know which tests were chosen for genetic sequencing by the state's lab. I think we should just behave as though you know, it, we could have the variant here. It's, we, we don't know that we don't. And I think the best thing we can do on a practical level is just act as though it's here and really double down on the safety precautions we know will work to keep this from spreading more quickly. Um, it's maybe not the most satisfying answer. I know we like to know what more, but I don't know that we have much control in that area. So I think we should all just use it as a reminder to be very careful and cautious in our interactions in the next weeks and months ahead, just to make sure we can do everything in our power to avoid a potential surge here in Cook County. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Administrator Yorkie. Um, I had a, I had similar questions as well, and um, yeah, Grace, thank you. You answered them very thoroughly. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Grace right now? Well, I can't see anything, but hearing none, um, just want to thank you again, Grace, for your, for your work and. Um, yeah, it's funny how it was only a week ago, but it does seem like a long time just with everything going on and, and how quickly news can spread and, and whatnot. But it was a great piece um, that covered, covered Cook County and, and our volunteer base, too. So um, thank you. Um, we can also um, hear from Mike Keyport now. Or, or, I can't see you, Mike, but would you like to give an update? For sure. Good morning, Mr. Chair, commissioners, community members. I'm uh, reporting this morning from the EOC, so it's I'm in the always busy community center. So if there's some background noise, I certainly apologize. Uh, the EOC, of course, remains open and both virtually and, and physically here. I continue to meet, of course, with the state and, uh, and, and our region uh, around the state and, and especially our region, of course, just like much like here, everything's a uh, vaccine, vaccine. Uh, however, uh, 
However, the Northeast and the Northwest regions have had to kind of move some of their emergency management uh, over to the line three event events and, and, and the state, the George Floyd trial. So there is people are, the, that's just how emergency management works. We have to go where the, where the problems are. And so that's, that's what's happening around the state and the region. Uh, one question that did come up uh, since we met last is that uh, how long is FEMA will continue to reimburse us for the things that we are that we are putting in for. And the answer to that question is uh, right now anyway, is September 30th, 2021. Uh, they, we were assured early on that we would have a 30 day notice before they pull the plug on us, if you will. So, so, uh, so I'll keep you all abreast of that, of course. But, but right now the date is September 30th. This year, so so we can so we can continue to seek reimbursement for the things that we are on throughout the summer. So that's good news. Uh, we do have a Jim and I here in the EOC do have a supply of hand sanitizer, and we were kind of waiting towards more spring here. So we are going to do a an event this morning for two hours and allow businesses to come and pick up hand sanitizer as they need. Jim Boyd at the Chamber of Commerce works with us on that and gets it out to the businesses. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that'll go well with, with spring coming and the businesses opening up. Uh, lastly, and probably, well, most important to me is that Jim Wienanen's, uh temporary employment of, of the year is up this week. So Jim's Jim's last day with us will be this Friday, the 12th. Uh, what can I say? It's been a, a blessing to me, but uh, so as I spoke last year, you know, in any event disaster, uh, you know, we, we scale up or we scale down depending on the situation. And when this when this broke loose last March, we did, we scaled it up. And now we're at a point where we can maybe be, be able to start scaling it back down. So so here in the ELC, you know, Jim and I will work the rest of the week and tweak things out here and, and dial things down a little bit. I'm, I will still leave equipment and things over here and, and gradually can kind of scale that down as the summer months come. Uh, the big, the biggest thing that Jim's been doing for us is answering the uh, COVID hotline, we call it. So Grace is working on moving that, that phone line to, uh, to public health likely, or the clinic so that that line will still be available. It, it stays fairly, fairly busy, surprisingly, especially since the vaccine started. There's many, many vaccine questions, as you can, as you can understand, but uh, we'll continue to move on. That's that's my report for you this morning. Thank you, Mike. Um, does anyone have any questions for for my keyboard this morning? Mr. Chairman, this is James. Yes, Administrator Yorkey. Yes, uh, Mike. Thanks for your report this morning and for for all your good work. Um, you know, with Jim's. Uh, leaving us this week and with uh, the news of you know a, a new variant in the state not not to overplay that um, but I you know I'm wondering and, and also with the fact that it's been a very um, very dry winter we don't have a lot of snow on the ground and I've heard you uh, talk about the the risk for fire this spring um, and I'm just wondering do we have sufficient a capability if if we see a spike in cases here and also perhaps are are contending with an enhanced fire risk um, are there steps that we should be taking to to prepare for that and make sure that uh, we're not caught flat-footed when uh, if something happens i i think the biggest thing uh, mr yorkie is uh is this community center has became the hub for our vaccines and it needs to stay that way. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's also our EOC. I have meetings upcoming with the Forest Service DNR. Uh, we are meeting with dispatch and the sheriff's office. 
uh, and, and Kyle from uh, GIS about evacuation plans upcoming here. Uh, the fire, the fire uh, departments have what they call their cooperators meeting that's coming up in early April. So there's a lot of things uh, leaning towards the, the wildfire uh, uh, response should we, should we need that. The biggest thing is like I say with the community center, we can't upset the vaccine apple cart here. So I'll, I, I may be reaching out to the forest service to see if, should we have an event like that? If we could use their facility, they have a large conference room at their facility here in town to, to potentially move an EOC over there for wildfire response. So things can maintain COVID response here at, here at the county and the community center. So that's one of the things I'm working on for that response. If I could be of any assistance to you um, in doing that work, let me know, please. Appreciate that. Thank you, um, Mr. Yorkie and, and, and Mike. Um, does it, does it, do any commissioners have any questions or comments for, for Mike this morning? I don't hear any, um, but I had, again, similar questions to as Administrator Yorkie just around the wildfire and, um, and um, the, the needs that sound like they're forthcoming here, but uh, I trust that uh, Mr. Keeper, you're on it and, um, and that you'll certainly reach out if, if more resources are needed um, and just keep us informed. So thank you very much for your update and, and your continued work. And um, we couldn't be doing it without you guys and, uh, and we're so much better um, because of the work you've done. So thank you. Um, I think we can move on in our agenda. Uh, however, I did fail to read the statement that uh, should be read to, to uh, let people know why we're having these virtual meetings rather than in person. And so I'll do that now, try to correct my error here. Uh, number one, it has been de determined that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the related peacetime emergency declaration made by Governor Walls in accordance with Minnesota Statutes Chapter 12. Number two, we have ensured that all members of the body participating in the meeting, wherever their physical location, can hear one another and can hear all discussion and testimony offered at today's meeting. Number three, we have also ensured that members of the public present at the regular meeting location of the body can hear all discussion, testimony, and all votes of the members of the body. We have urged the public not to attend this meeting in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic and have ensured that members of the public can view and monitor the meeting remotely in real time by broadcasting the meeting on the Cook County website. Number four, due to the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic, we have determined that this may be unfeasible for County Auditor Brady Powers, County Attorney Molly Hicken, County Administrator James Yorkie, members of the Board of Commissioners to be physically present at the County Boardroom at the Cook County Courthouse. Number five, all votes will be conducted by roll call, so each member's vote on each issue will be identified and recorded. All right, I checked that box. My apologies for missing it earlier. And um, with that, we can... Um, move on to the open meeting law review. Attorney Hicken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, do I have your permission to share my screen for my PowerPoint? Well, as far as I'm concerned, that would be wonderful. I, I won't be able to see it, but, um, but everyone else can. Okay, well, I'll be reading these slides out loud for you. So I have a brief um, slideshow here for you. It's about 12 slides. Um, and we have a short amount of time because I need, I have a court hearing at 930, but we will get through this and stop me with questions if you have them. Um, first, I just want to say that the legal information presented at this session is intended for a specific audience and that's Cook County Commissioners. Others who are viewing this presentation for informational purposes are advised that it doesn't constitute legal advice for you. Um, and that individuals should contact their own attorneys and seek out resources specific to their own situations. Does everyone see my title screen that says open meeting law, Minnesota statutes 
13D? Yes, we do. Awesome. All right, let's first talk about the purpose of open meeting law. Um, the reason I chose this to present this topic first is how very frequently it comes up without even thinking about it when um, hardworking, well-meaning commissioners are trying to get their work done in between meetings. Um, open meeting law is something that you have to kind of train your brain to always think about. Um, you've entered a room and you see two other commissioners, what should you be thinking? Uh, you should be thinking this is a quorum. Um, was this meeting noticed or do I need to turn around and leave? Uh, and the purpose for that for open meeting law is to prohibit actions from being taken at a secret meeting where it's impossible for the interested public to become fully informed concerning a public body's decision or to detect improper influences. So the public needs to be watching their elected officials in general. Um, it's to assure the public's right to be informed and to afford the public an opportunity to present its views to the public body. Um, the general premise is that members of the public should have the opportunity to observe when a public body gathers to conduct business. Um, so what value of Cook County, which we identified in the last strategic planning period, and what core value of a democratic society does open meeting law uphold? Any guesses? Transparency. That's kind of, if you were to put the reason for open meeting law into one word, I think it would be transparency. General rule, once again, is that meetings of public bodies must be open to the public. We're gonna cover what is a public body, what is a meeting, and what does it mean to make that meeting open? You should also be aware that uh, if the local government gets accused in court of violating open meeting law, the court is going to construe the law in favor of the public's right to full access to decision meeting. That means they're gonna give a lot of latitude to the words in the law and not a lot of consideration to the special circumstances of the local government. What is a public body? Um, obviously the county board, um, our regular meetings, our special meetings, our working sessions and our workshops, committees and subcommittees and commissions of the county board, which have decision-making authority passed on to them by the board um, are also gonna be considered public bodies. Um, also uh, just generally in the community, the EDA is, the school board, any joint powers entities and boards, the planning commission and the um, zoning board of adjustment. Just a further note um, on committees. So the rule is if they have the authority to exercise decision-making powers, they're gonna be subject to open meeting law. Um, this, is, this would generally not be an, an advisory committee. Um, uh, sometimes those committees like the planning commission or the board of adjustment are given decision-making authority through statute or ordinance. Sometimes it's a formal act of delegation. Um, and sometimes it is in practice, the board is just adopting um, the, the recommendations of a committee uh, without any discussion or thought or, um, or real consideration. Um, and that could be found to have that the public body had delegated authority and that um, committee should be open. Um, it's also gonna be presumed that the committee has decision-making authority if a quorum of commissioners is present. And that makes sense. We're gonna go on to talk about what is a meeting. Any questions so far? Okay, so at its basics, a meeting consists of a quorum and discussion of county business. A quorum for our five member board is three. For a seven member board, like the human services board, it would be five. 
And uh, you also have discussion of county business. A meeting is a gathering of a quorum where members are discussing county business. Um, discussing, deciding, or even receiving information as a group on issues related to the official business of the governing body. There is a Minnesota AG opinion, which um, stated that a city council attendance at a League of Minnesota Cities training program did not violate the law if the members did not discuss specific municipal business. Um, so when it comes to specific uh, like training programs, we're just gonna address those on a case by case basis and look at the content of the training and the format of it to decide. But generally in this county, we err on the side of noticing. What is not a meeting? Telephone conversations between uh, two commissioners wouldn't be a meeting typically. Um, letters, uh, information which is distributed by mail, whether it's email or US post. Uh, and I've got some, you know, I have some modifications to this advice in the next slide. So keep that in mind. Um, however, you cannot, if it is found that the type of communication was created for the purpose of circumventing open meeting law or trying to avoid its requirements, um, for example, by having serial meetings with less than a quorum, it's going to be found to be a violation of open meeting law. Um, let's move on to some things to be aware of. Um, you may not consider a meeting or an email to a group of people, including all five commissioners, to be a meeting. But if a commissioner were to reply all to that, um, email. Now you have all five commissioners who know the opinion related, the opinion of one commissioner related to that subject. If a second commissioner then responded, replied all on that same topic, why then you have um, three commission, at least three commissioners or a quorum uh, who know the opinions of three others or themselves plus two others, which is a quorum. Um, so I would like for you to make it a practice when you see a group email come through and you're considering responding to scan that recipient list and see whether you've got fellow commissioners in the recipient list. If there is a quorum, um, I would advise you not to reply all. Always pause before you use that reply all. Um, there are exceptions when it comes to just scheduling. If you're just talking about, uh, you know, what is your schedule for availability for um, setting the next meeting time and place, um, that's okay. That's not, um, you know, considered like really the guts of county business. It's just setting up a meeting. But in all other cases, you're going to want to be very careful. So often when I'm sending information to all five commissioners, I will put some italicized language at the top, which says, please don't reply all to this email. Um, the danger is that you will be found to have had a meeting by email. Uh, so that is, that's something to avoid. Um, there, if, if your communication more resembles like letters sent over time um, in response to information that's going to be less like a meeting. If that makes sense. If that conversation is more like an in person back and forth, then it's going to be more like a meeting. So let's talk about um, the type of meeting that we're in right now, which is by interactive TV or electronic means, um, and in some cases by phone. This first type of meeting is uh, in 13D02 in the statute. Um, and this is interactive TV meetings under certain conditions where there is no pandemic or state emergency in place. Um, the factors are almost the same as today's meeting. All commissioners and public 
um, present at the regular meeting location can hear and see one another and can hear and see all discussion and testimony being presented at any of their locations. Um, so in this case, you have at least one member present in the regular meeting location. The members who are dialing into the ITV meeting need to also be in public places that are accessible by the public and open. And those places that they're appearing from um, need to be in the notice. So um, in the notice of the meeting, when it goes out, you have to say, um, you know, Molly will be at the Java Moose and, um, and James will be um, appearing from the community center. All of those places need to ostensibly be where people could walk in the door and observe you being in the meeting. Uh, and also there needs to be a roll call vote. Um, so this is without the pandemic. How this changes is when there is a pandemic or an emergency in place and your presiding officer, legal counsel, or the county administrator has made a determination that it is not practical or prudent for members of uh, the board the county attorney, the auditor, the administrator to be physically present in the regular meeting place um, and has also made a determination that it's not practical or prudent for members of the public to be in that regular meeting place. There has to have been a health pandemic or an emergency declared under chapter 12, which has obviously been the case for us for almost a year now. Almost a year. Um, and then you still have those same rules that all commissioners can hear and see um, participating discussion can hear and see all discussion and testimony. Um, it, it looks like I made a slight error in this language because um, this does allow meetings by phone, which means those members who are by phone need not be able to see others and um, the others need not be able to see them. But other than that, these are your requirements. What does not fall into the definition of a meeting are uh, social uh, meetings by chance. If three of you end up in the grocery store at the same time, just by chance, um, or a purely social gathering, so long as you th then do not discuss county business. Um, obviously, if you don't have a quorum, less than three commissioners, it's not a meeting. Um, if it's not members of the public body, it's county employees or staff, um, that's not a meeting, a subject to open meeting law. Um, and there is also this other exception, <clears throat> which is that a gathering of a quorum where an employee hands out a copy of a written document to each, but then there is no group discussion, that is not a meeting. Um, training or educational events. Um, so this goes back to that AG op opinion that I mentioned before. If there's a quorum intermingled with a larger number of other attendees and the info is not specific to the county board and no county business is discussed, you may be able to get into uh, an exception to open meeting law. Um, or written communications among a quorum of officials. This, um, so the second bullet point, you need to think back to that other slide where if those written communications are more like a letter mailed and then a few days later a letter mailed back, um, it's not going to be open meeting law um, requirement. Uh, but if you're talking about emails back and forth among a quorum, that's different. Are there any questions so far? We're going to hit what um, open means. In other words, once you have a meeting, what is what are your requirements? Any questions before we hit that? Okay, we're going to talk about the notice required, which includes meeting place and time, uh, voting records required, and what are our rules about printed materials presented at meetings.
To be an open meeting, um, you need adequate notice to the public. It's gonna be different for special meetings and emergency meetings than it is for the regular meetings. For regular meetings, notice just consists of having your regular meeting time and place available and posted at the primary office of the county. Um, if you're gonna change around your meeting time and place for a specific meeting, you're gonna need to notice pursuant to the special meeting notice requirements. So let's move on to special meeting notice requirements. So this is any meeting that occurs um, outside of that regular schedule. Um, couple requirements for special meeting notice. It's a three day timing. So at least three business days prior to the meeting, you need to post your notice of the time and location. You also need to include the purpose of your special meeting in that notice. Um, then when you hold that special meeting, you have to <clears throat> limit your discussion to the purpose that you've noticed. Emergency meetings, I, I'm having trouble thinking of any that have occurred when I've been county attorney. Um, this would be a very special circumstance um, that requires the immediate attention of the public body and then you just give as much notice as you can. If you recess a meeting, let's say it's going too long and you're in the middle of you're in the middle of something important that you need to finish before the next regular meeting, um, you announce when the meeting will be continued, um, and then you have uh, and so long as you have let's see, yes, so long as during the original properly noticed meeting you've announced where you'll continue the meeting and when, you don't need to additionally publish anything. Um, although it might be a good idea for transparency, it's not a legal requirement. If you're gonna have a closed session, even if the public can't be there and observe, you still have to ab abide by the same notice requirements. The public gets to know that you're having this closed session or that you're likely to have a closed session at a specific time and place. Um, county board workshops work, working sessions, they all need to be noticed like special meetings unless they're occurring at the time and place of your regular meeting. The other piece of this, of the open meeting, is that um, the voting records, somebody needs to be there keeping track of who votes for what, and then that journal, voting journal, is kept at the primary office of the, of the public body. It needs to be available to the public during normal business hours. and printed materials. So this means any materials that are distributed at the meeting or before the meeting or available um, in the meeting room to all commissioners also need to be available to the public um, during the meeting. Sometimes if new materials are presented at the meeting, uh, what we'll do is we'll ask April to upload them to the website so that they become available. Um, but best practice is to have actually a printed copy in the regular meeting room if we're talking about an in-person meeting. Obviously, when it's not public information, you are not required to do this. Closed meetings. Um, so we have two types of closed meetings, uh, meetings that must be closed under certain circumstances, and then meetings where the board can make the choice to close. We're going to start with that um, voluntary closed meetings. Um, so this would be, for example, uh, Public Employment Labor Relations Act um, meetings. Uh, these still must be tape recorded. Attorney client privilege. So if there is litigation uh, and the attorney needs to provide commissioners with advice in a confidential setting, that can be a closed meeting, not recorded. Um, if the commissioners are, perform are doing a performance evaluation on an individual under their authority, that may or may not be um, closed. It, it's generally closed unless the individual asks that it be open. Property transactions, and we have one of these coming up in today's meeting, are a reason that you may close the meeting. And finally, security briefings for obvious reasons. 
So all closed sessions, whether we talk about them in this slide or next, uh, must be recorded with the exception of attorney client privilege. Those are not recorded. You must close a meeting, so no choice in cases like where you've um, preliminarily considering an allegation or a charge against an employee, unless that employee requests that the meeting remain open. So um, thankfully, this is a rare occasion. Um, and then if you're discussing certain not public da data or private data, like data which would identify alleged victims or reports of criminal sexual conduct, domestic abuse, or maltreatment of minors, active like law enforcement investigative data in the case that that would need to be presented to the board for some reason you've got to close the meeting um, and then educational health medical or mental health data so in the motion to close or to consider closing this type of meeting what you're going to do is identify in general the type of data that you're going to discuss and avoid identifying the actual individual um, attached to that data. The procedure for closing a meeting is that the county board or uh, whichever public body it is, is going to state on the record the specific grounds permitting the meeting to be closed, talk about the subject to be discussed, um, and then have a vote and take action to close the meeting. And again, all closed meetings are recorded except attorney client privileged meetings. Here are some resources. Um, MCIT.org has an excellent resource center. I think you need a login for that. And um, if you have trouble um, finding a login, just contact MCIT. Um, Data Practices Office is a state office. Um, this office uh, issues opinions, which are really helpful and designs trainings on both data practices, which is next week's topic and on open meeting law. They've got a phone number you can call or you can go to their website. And then hopefully um, by um, the end of next week, you should have a new version of the commissioner handbook. And I've got several um, different articles in that handbook that you can refer to always uh, feel free to talk to me or to James also if you have open meeting questions. Okay, any questions? Thank you, Attorney Hicken. Um, in my short experience on the board, um, where I see open meeting law um, being most of an issue is in the reply all situation of, of an email. Um, and then also, I think there's um, public perception that if if there is a chance social gathering of commissioners that that is and, and you know I try to avoid it. I usually just back away if if that happens, um, just to just to avoid that public perception. But but it is not a violation of open meeting law if there is that chance social thing. But um, yeah, perception is such a uh, an optics is such a, a big. Um, part of our job that I just try to, you know, avoid any potential um, conflict that that people might perceive. So I don't have any questions though myself. Does anyone else? Is it all pretty? Is that pretty clear? I know there's been some talk at AMC as well about it. So um, we can we can have more discussion down the road too. So thank you, Attorney Hicken, for, for taking the time here and giving us a, a little briefing. And um, I know you have to duck away and then we'll be we'll be connecting um, on the other side as well, so. Okay, we'll see you soon. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. All right, and uh, moving on in our agenda, um, we have, uh, Legislative discussion at 10:30, and so we can jump ahead um, since it's just 9:30 now to number six with the Highway Department, Engineer Haas. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, this will be pretty quick. I think we talked about it um, a couple weeks ago at the last COW um, or Committee of the Whole, I guess. Um, but this is our Gunflint Trail Scenic Byway Sign Policy, um, and for a quick recap. 
This was put together between um, myself and then the Scenic Byway Committee um, just to establish, you know, kind of how we want to sign the trail. You know, it has its unique designation as a, as a National Scenic Byway. Um, and so treating it as such is, is pretty important. Um, you know, we're, we're familiar with, you know, how, how um, you know, the state, you know, has, has regulations on how you want to sign, you know, a, a typical highway. And, you know, we want to treat this differently. And that was kind of the point of this. Um, the other big point was to create a collaborative effort um, between myself, or not even just me, but the highway department and the scenic byway into the future of, you know, if, if new signs need to get put up, you know, to talk about it between everybody and see, um, you know, you know, create a consensus on that, on that part. So um, it's pretty simple, page and a half, <laughs> identifies, you know, what, what signs, not, not specific things, but just examples of kind of, here's a regulatory sign, here's an example of how that can come down, here's a warning sign, here's an example of how that can come down. And so it's balancing safety and, you know, kind of the unique qualities of the trail. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about it at all. Um, I know we kind of talked about it, you know, quite a bit before, but open, open to questions. Thank you, Engineer Haas. Um, any commissioners have any questions, comments? Commissioner Sullivan. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to thank you, Robbie, for doing a great job of working with the Gunflint Trail Scenic Byways group. And I know they have looked forward to the day when there can be collaboration about the signs and try to make sure that we eliminate the redundancy that we've seen along the trail. And I just appreciate the work you've done, um, taking all the photographs, traveling up and down the trail. I've seen all of that. And um, I just wanna commend you for reaching out and truly creating a collaboration between these two entities. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Um, any other commissioners have questions or comments? I don't, I don't see any or hear any. Um, I, uh, Engineer Haas, I did have concerns because of the lack of specifics in the policy, but I do recognize that this is a, a wonderful first step in that collaboration. My hope is that down the road, um, that, that collaboration can spell out more specifics, um, just how, how signage is selected or, or just different criteria and that sort of thing. I think the examples do a great job of the intention there, um, but it doesn't, um, beyond, beyond collaboration, it doesn't necessarily spell anything out. Um, so I, I do appreciate that, that excellent first step of collaboration and, and I hope uh, we can take it further in the future, but um, we'll, we'll see how that, how that works with the collaboration, right? Um, thank you, just as Commissioner Sullivan said, thank you for, for putting this together and that, and that good first step. So, um, otherwise, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I would entertain a motion to approve. Commissioner Sullivan. I move to approve the Gunflint Trail Scenic Byway sign policy. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion. Is there support? Falson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Salson. Uh, any further discussion? Otherwise, a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous uh, support and approval of uh, policy. Thank you, Engineer Hoff. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. And yeah, you know, it's a, it's a living document. It's a conversation. So, you know, if specifics, you know, I think once we get rolling with it more and we get a full inventory done, you know, being able to be more specific like that will, will come into the future. So I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good work. Have a great day. You too. All right, that brings us all the way to number seven already with human resources. Um, I don't, oh, there's, there's a- Good morning, Chairman Director Mills. Dixon right there, yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, so um, good morning, Chairman Mills, commissioners, colleagues, and members of the community. 
Uh, currently, when a resignation occurs and we need to hire, there is a two-step approval process at the county. First, the department head requests that the Board of Commissioners approve the resignation and uh, to post the position to begin recruiting for a replacement. Then, after the recruiting and selection process is complete and a contingent offer has been made, the department head requests that the Board of Commissioners approve the selected candidate and salary. I'm asking the board today to consider eliminating the need for approval to begin recruiting in instances of job replacement. While resignations are sometimes planned for, most times they're not. And our departments run lean. And when someone resigns, it leaves a gap in service and or shifts the work to coworkers who already have very full plates. Having the ability to post the job immediately reduces the amount of time uh, the job is vacant, thus mitigating the potential for negative impact on service levels, as well as employee well-being. I'm requesting a change to the current hiring process to allow for a faster pivot and to begin recruiting immediately for positions that are job replacements. So that is my proposal this morning to you. Thank you, Director Dixon. Uh, do we have any questions or comments uh, regarding the proposal? Commissioner Huckins. Yes, thank you, Chairman Mills. Um, yeah, as a former employee, I understand why this may be necessary and um, think it probably is a smart way to go forward. I also maybe have concerns that um, things just happen because it's always happened that way. Um, and I'm thinking about like Diane Booth's position. This is gonna be a time where we're gonna to have to rethink how that department works. So I'd hate to have it in a policy that we're gonna find another exactly Diane Booth without a process for does that make sense? So that's my concern. I totally understand as a former employee working in that kind of environment, how important that is to hurry up the process. I tried to advocate for that previously. So I'm just trying to make sure we're considering all of the ramifications of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. In response to that, um, Commissioner Hawkins, those conversations are occurring prior to even considering opening up for recruiting. Um, and, and it's a retirement res resignation. Um, which is uh, planned for, right? And so uh, our county administrator is working with Diane in this instance with that example um, to think about what is the best structure moving forward. Um, this policy, I don't think would get in the way with something like that <clears throat> where it is planned and those conversations take place prior to even contacting me to start recruiting. So I, I believe uh, department heads have a sense of um, what's happening in their organizations, um, what their structure needs to be, what their resource allocation needs to look like. And um, I don't believe that this policy change would preclude us from having those conversations up front prior to getting to me to, to start recruiting. I don't think that stands in the way uh, I think the intent of this policy is the majority of situations where uh, this is a gap, a, a sudden gap that we need to replace quickly. Thank you, Director Dixon. And uh, Minister Yorkey, you had, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, Commissioner Hawkins, I, I agree with you completely. When we have high level positions that we know people are going to be retiring um, I, I think we always need to have the conversation about, you know, does this, how, how does this current job description fit where we are right now? Um, are there things that we need to modify about it to, to make it serve the organization, the community better? Um, I, I would totally agree with that. And I think the, the purpose of the policy, again, as, as Pamela pointed out, is just to help us when we have, you know, unexpected um, 
resignations due to people moving on to other jobs or whatever. Um, in the past, it's it's created a gap. Um, I'm thinking about like in the assessor's office, which we discussed uh, a few meetings ago, um, which can really create a burden for the department, for the people who are left behind with, with a vacant position and having to fill, um, do their own jobs in addition to the, the vacant position. So uh, this, this just allows us to move more quickly toward uh, rehiring somebody and it does not in any way exclude the board from, from the approval process. Um, so I think this is a really good positive direction for us to, to take. Thank you, Administrator Yorkie. Uh, Commissioner Salson. Yeah, good conversation. I also uh, agree under our form of, of governing. Um, if you have a, an established position, the ability to move forward with that um, it, upon a resignation is really key to continuing to operate you know, efficiently. Um, if any of our, our commissioners or anyone else has a question about the size of an organization or the structure of an organization or any, that type of thing, you're better served to have that conversation with the administrator ahead of time, um, you know, before you would fall into that situation. So I, I don't see this as being something that would um, negate or, or remove any of the governance features that we currently depend on. Just my opinion. Thank you, Commissioner Swanson. Um, any other um, questions or comments? Um, for myself, I, I, I also, um, you know, I'm always trying to look at as many different angles as I can and, um, and, and want to recognize the questions that Commissioner Hawkins had about, um, about the process and, and just that need for flexibility and reevaluating and, and yeah, I, I um, don't believe that this policy would would preclude us being able to do that. Um, it just, as Commissioner Swalson said, just enables us to um, to to more efficiently move forward and and um, allow staff to to do their job better. So, um, without any permission from the board. So I'm I think it's a also a good a good move on on our part. So I appreciate um, Director Dixon bringing it forward here. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I would entertain a motion. Commissioner Sullivan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve streamlining the resignation and hiring process as presented. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Um, do we have support? Commissioner Hawkins. Commissioner Hawkins, support. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Uh, do we have any further discussion? Hearing, seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well, approved unanimously. Um, thank you, Director Dixon. And we have uh, two more items um, for you, uh, item B, and then we did move uh, one item from the consent agenda um, as well. That's, uh, um, that was item E, the extension of Judy Sievertson's temporary employment, but I'll let you go on to item, item B. Uh, item B, the county auditor treasurer requested that the job description accountant financial coordinator be re revised to ensure accuracy and completeness and that a job evaluation be conducted to confirm the appropriate pay grade. The job description was revised accordingly and per policy submitted for review by the personnel committee. After being reviewed and affirmed by the personnel committee, the job description was submitted to job evaluation committee for classification of pay grade. The result of that job evaluation concluded that the accountant financial coordinator is classified at a grade 180. This is a change from the current grade of 170. So the request today is to approve that grade change. Uh, thank you, Director Dixon. Do we have any questions or comments uh, on this item? Uh, 
I see none. I hear none. In that case, I would entertain a motion. I'll move that we uh, approve the revised auditor, accountant, financial coordinator, job description, and classification. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion. Is there support? Swallison supports. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Uh, we have a motion and support. Is there any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Uh, unanimous approval there. Thank you, Director Dixon. And then um, I, we didn't discuss this um, when we removed it, but I thought it might fit under, under um, your time here um, talking about um, item E from the consent agenda regarding Judy Sievertson's um, extension, temporary extension. Commissioner Hawkins, did you um, have specific questions in regards to, to that? Yeah, I guess actually um, Mike Keyport kind of answered that publicly and I just wanted to make sure that the public was aware about this position, that, um, that this is a covered position under FEMA. I'm just wanna make sure that we're clear as a board that this is not under the replacement policy that we just approved, that this is a temporary FEMA funded. And if FEMA funded funding runs out, we do not replace this. I just, I guess I wanted to make that public rather than all of us getting phone calls about this. I just think it's easier this way. So that was my purpose for wanting to discuss this further. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Um, Administrator Yorkey. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add one thing to that. I have talked with Judy Sievertson about the position and she is happy to remain in it. Um, she is uh, planning to, to uh, travel a little bit this summer and so she would expect to be available through about the third week of May. Um, after that, we would have to look to see what the need is for the position. I'm hoping with the progress that we're making in vaccinating residents, um, that we might be at a point in May where we could simply uh, not fill that position. And that's, that's my expectation at this point. Um, if something changes where we have an outbreak of one, you know, the new variant here in the community, um, that could be a factor that would cause us to reconsider whether we fill that position. But at this point, I'm expecting that um, that after the third week of May, we might have that. Thank you, Administrator Yorkey. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments uh, around this item? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve. Commissioner Sullivan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve the extension of Judy Sievertson's temporary employment. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion. Is there support? Commissioner Swallison supports. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing or hearing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have un unanimous approval there. Thank you very much. And thank you, Director Dixon, for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, moving on to item eight under auditor. Um, first item is 2021 DNR Firewise Grant Application Firewise. Auditor Powers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a, a grant that we have uh, typically received um, either every year or every other year. It's sometimes an 18 month grant. It funds the basics of our uh, ongoing Firewise program. This year, uh, the total amount of the grant is 71,700, which includes 
300 of the uh, property assessments, uh, estimated 50 brush disposals, uh, an estimated 10 brush pickup days, and uh, from home ignition zone work, and then 10,000 for elderly or disabled homeowners on a 50-50 cost share to help uh, fix up their properties for Firewise. $1,000 for Firewise demonstration days and 10,000 for edu educational messaging and a seventh grade Firewise trip, total of 71,700. Um, 63 of it is covered by match, the homeowner match primarily, and then 10,000 for the, uh, if the elderly disabled homeowners uh, take part in that, they pay half of it. Um, so what asked for approval, this is to, this is an 18 month grant starting uh, June uh, when the season really begins and going until the end of November of uh, 2022. Thank you, Editor Powers. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments about this item? Hearing or seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve. Commissioner Salson. I uh, move to approve the Firewise grant as discussed. In order. Thank you, Commissioner Salson. We have a motion. Is there support? Storley support. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion and support. Uh, any further discussion? Otherwise, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous approval there. Thank you, Auditor Powers. Uh, moving on to item B there, miscellaneous fees and public hearing. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, skip over and move to the letter of appreciation just to do these two firewives uh, together. Sure. It's okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Part of the reason we put the uh, DNR Firewise grant application on there was just to demonstrate a lot of the work that's being done by the Firewise Committee now. And at the last uh, meeting, of course, we heard that um, our uh, coordinator, Todd Armbruster, has left to take a job at the city of uh, Duluth. We're trying to fill that position in the committee asked if the board would consider uh, sending Todd a letter of appreciation. And part of it is uh, the list of things you see in this grant application. That's, that's really expanded over his time, his six years here. I think he's kind of trans, his, his presence here and the work he's done has kind of transformed the committee functions. Uh, that committee was really driven by uh, I call them super volunteers in the in the beginning, like Dick Parker, and uh, and some others. And you were really reliant on having people like that available. And once Todd got here and got established, that we we didn't require that anymore. The board could could focus more on planning and strategy and things like that. I mean, it's great to have those volunteers and you need them, but uh, we were really reliant on that alone. And uh, We've kind of solved with his help this uh, the slash brush issue that we worked on and worked on for years and years, managing all these brush pickup days and managing the movement of that slash, the, those piles, those sites. We've got a pretty efficient system running now. And the third thing is the community engagement. Um, it was always kind of a hope and a plan out there, but he put it into practice and we have many of these uh, communities, mostly uh, around lakes that are kind of self-organized now that they're developed. And they actually take part and, and do a lot of the developing and organizing of these brush days and things like that. So just asking if um, we could work with either yourself or maybe Bob Swallowson on the committee to write that letter and that the board chair would sign it. Great. Um, do we have any questions or comments? 
I didn't expect any, but uh, otherwise I'd look for a, uh, a motion to to approve a, a letter of appreciation. Commissioner Sullivan. I move to approve the letter of appreciation. Um, and I would just echo that Todd has done an Todd's outstanding, done an outstanding job, job bringing that, that program to the next level. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have support? Wallace and support. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Uh, any uh, further discussion? Otherwise, we'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Thank you very much. All right, Brady, so the, the second item then is the, or now it's the third rather, the miscellaneous fees public hearing. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thanks. So just a little background, the miscellaneous fees is a, a particular statute that allows counties to establish or um, change fees, but only after holding a public hearing. And these are fees that they're called miscellaneous because they're, they don't have a particular statute surrounding them. Some fees counties charge um, are under statute are liquor fees, liquor license um, are set by law, et cetera. So uh, these are the other types of fees. Um, copy, copy costs, for, for example, is just the most basic one. So typically we've scheduled these when departments um, ask uh, that, that they have a, a fee to change. And usually this is in response to some cost because we can't charge more than what we estimate the cost of, of any of these are. And typically, in a lot of things, it doesn't cover all the costs, but it, it might cover some substantial part of the cost. And typically, we've done one or two of these a year, and we try to schedule them out um, long enough so that we can uh, let all the department heads know, and if they do have uh, things that they're considering, that they have time to get that done. Um, so I was suggesting here uh, as uh, April 27th, or we could go even farther um, into May and the uh, departments, if they wanted then to figure that into their uh, budgets, et cetera, it's really close to when they'll be working on their budgets. So, so I'd suggest either late April or early May, but it's your choice. Uh, and currently we have one request by the uh, recorder's department, but I expect there'll be others once we uh, let the MAT team know. All right, do we have any questions or comments uh, regarding this and, and how do we feel about the April 27th date as far as timing is concerned? Chairman Mills? Yes, Commissioner Starley. Well, as we do, we work it in. Unless, you know, it'd be more beneficial to wait until the first part of May. Uh, right now, Brady only has one. Would we be better off to wait until the first meeting in May? I don't know. April 27th is the end of, of April. So I don't know. It's a toss up. Thank you. Any other uh, any other thoughts there, commissioners? In my, in my mind, it, it doesn't make. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hawkins, please. No, that's okay. I'm just gonna say I think end of April that would work fine. I don't see any issue with that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I think I was going to say for my part, I think April 27th is just fine. End of April. Um, yeah, I think that'll be fine. Great. Well, I'll entertain a motion to um, set the the um, the uh, 
miscellaneous fees public hearing uh, April 27th, and I believe we'd have to set a time to, um, so say, 10 a.m. Uh, Mr. Chair, it does state 9 o'clock. Oh, thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Storley. Well, I'm looking, so I'm looking for that motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve um, setting the date for the public hearing to be uh, changing the county's fee schedule and miscellaneous of miscellaneous fees to April 27th, 2021 at 9 a.m. Thank you, Commissioner Sterling. We have a motion. Is there a second? I will second that, Commissioner Hawkins. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing or seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Swalson? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous uh, approval to set the uh, public hearing for miscellaneous fees change April 27th at 9 a.m. Um, and of course, we can accept um, comment on that before the hearing um, in paper copy is, is my understanding. Is that correct? Yes, well, uh, I'll set a date um, so that all of this, everything that's available will be in the board packet uh, leading up to the meeting. Even with a, a long, uh, deadline like that uh, it's not unusual to have one or two asked to come in later so don't be surprised yeah i'd probably i'd probably do it april 28th if it was me so um, i understand how that works all right thank you very much and uh here we are it's it's 10:01. um we are anticipating uh a discussion with our legislators uh at 10 30. Um, the next item on the agenda, though, is a legal matter where um, uh, we may vote to to close the session. I don't know, Attorney Hicken, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, just to, I don't, I don't know that a half hour is enough time, um, but at least we can maybe just talk about why we may be closing and if there's any um, questions or or concerns there. Uh, thank or you, Brady. Yeah. I'm sorry, Brady yes. and Attorney Hicken. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I was going to ask that, um, Brady, that I also would be allowed to defer to Brady. Um, so, as you heard in the um, open meeting law presentation this morning, uh, when the county board is considering a sale of land, uh, you may close the meeting for discussion of um, the proposals in front of you. Um, another reason to consider closing, closing this meeting is that um, only the names of the people who submitted proposals for sale of this land are um, public at this time. Any other information about those bids, for example, the amount that they propose to buy the property for is not public until the um, sale is completely is, is finalized. Um, so you, we wouldn't have the ability to talk about actual numbers if the meeting was not closed. Um, so the way you would go about this is to discuss um, the reasons to close the meeting and to make a motion. The other important piece is that you identify the land um, which we're talking about in your motion. And so I think that's in your board packet. Um, I don't have it up right now. What else should yeah, we, we say, Brady? Um, we talked about, you know, the, of course, the closed session has to be electronically recorded. Um, yeah, we do, even in the, the, the basis of the report, it describes the property, the legal description. Um, I don't know if you want to go into the background now. We authorized advertising for sale of this property on February 25th, 2020, the first time, which we did. We, uh, we didn't actually do the advertising until spring, given um, the likelihood of people paying attention. 
so in the month of May, and then uh, we had three weeks, and then we also advertised in a newspaper general service. That was the other requirement. So we've met all the public requirements. We got no responses at that time. And so the pandemic hit, uh, things got pushed aside, and we didn't really look at this again until um, later in the fall after we had received no responses and the committee this is this is related to the revolving loan fund and uh, and then the committee met and decided that the best option was to offer it since we got no responses to try to offer it to adjacent uh, owners and that we take that first before trying to go uh, public again, maybe getting a real estate agent and all that. So this is really the adjacent owner option that we took at this time. So okay. and some of the further detail, I would wait for closed session. May I add something, Mr. Chair? I'm sorry? Um, may I add something, Mr. Absolutely, Chair? Absolutely, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so should the board vote to close the session for discussion of the uh, proposal to buy the property? Um, I have provided you a link to a different Zoom meeting, uh, which will not be public and which I can record. Um, and that should be in your email. I sent it out yesterday afternoon. And if you need it again, just let me know. I'll send it again. Thank you. Yeah. And um, yeah, kind of my intention was to do this after um, our discussion with, with Senator Bach and Representative Eckland. And I mean, I see Senator Bach has, has joined us. So welcome, Senator. Good, good morning. I was I, uh, I keep track of the temperature up north and my watch says it's 50 degrees on Lake Vermilion right now. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, don't don't believe it. <laughs> well, you got a, you got a little bit of an east wind in Grand Marais, so it's probably not quite as nice there. Yeah, it's uh, yesterday we had the sun, and boy, that does a whole lot. And now we still have a warm warm temperature, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I'm not ready for it. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I think I think I might be alone there though. Well, there was those, that, that little ten day run we had uh, earlier was. Pretty tough for us Finland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you you are early, and I and I appreciate that. Um, we this is it's perfect timing though because we're at a point now where, um, kind of our next item on the agenda, we we may vote to to enter into a closed session, and so I was hoping to do that after our discussion. Um, and but uh, I guess maybe to start we could just um, go around and introduce um, ourselves and uh, and then and then that's um, maybe going to give time to Representative Eklund to join uh, a little bit down the road and maybe we'll do reintroductions at that point too. So, um, uh, Commissioner Swallison, would you like to start with an uh, introduction of yourself? Good morning. I'm Bob Swallison and uh, elected in a special election in February to uh, fill District 1 here in Cook County. Welcome yep. to the board. Yeah, um, we had a special election, uh, Commissioner uh, Bobby Deshaw, who is now Tribal Chair Bobby Deshaw up in Grand Portage. That was uh, District 1 was his seat. So um, yeah, very, very grateful to have a full board again. Um, Administrator Yorkie, um, I know you just took a swig here, but would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Senator. I'm James Yorkie. I'm the County Administrator, and I really appreciate you making the time for us this morning. Well, welcome. Where did you come from? Uh, I've spent most of my career. New. I know you're new, so. Yeah. Yeah, I started in October, and I've spent most of my professional career in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Born, born in Minnesota? Uh, Michigan, actually. Very good. Yeah, we, we feel pretty lucky to have uh, Administrator Yarkey now, too. Um, we've got a really, really good team going going forward here. Um, 
Commissioner Sullivan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, Senator Bach. I'm Ann Sullivan, and I was elected last November to District 4 as their new commissioner. Great. I kind of um, follow these county commissioner races in the Cook, the Cook County News Herald. I got to tell you, those small towns, when you have a district as big as mine, and there are eight states in our country, actually, that are smaller than my Senate district, uh, those, those old small town newspapers are critically important to be able to keep track of what's going on back in your community, especially when we spend you know, half of our life in St. Paul on top of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I imagine it's, it's and and then to also uh, read between the lines and all that too, it can it can be tricky. Um, uh, Commissioner Hawkins, would you like to introduce yourself? Morning, Senator Bach. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. I am Stacy Hawkins, new commissioner from District Two. Good. Well, welcome to the board. <laughs> And then we have um, Attorney Hicken here with us. Welcome, Senator Bach. Uh, Molly Hicken, Cook County Attorney. Thanks for being here. And Molly, how long have you been in that position? 2014 is when I was first appointed and then elected. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Storley, of course, too. Uh, as with us, she, uh, Commissioner Storley is um, our most uh, veteran commissioner on the board here, but uh, I'll let her introduce herself. Good morning, Senator. I really miss not being down in St. Paul, meeting with all of you in your offices, but this is the best we can do. So I look forward to your report. Well, well Jenny, don't get too used to this because uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite challenging. I mean, I just have a, and I know this is this is easy for some people to find a way to do outreach to to your to the state capitol, but it's it's not as functional as I'd like it to be. I mean, we go through committee hearings, we got no handouts. I mean, I just had a bill up this morning in the local government committee. The committee members didn't have a copy of the bill, uh, you know, because we don't we're not in a committee room where people can can see handouts and kind of face-to-face -face network on things. So hopefully we can get over this period of time because we right. would be much, much more effective going forward when we actually can get together personally and, and network important to all of us. So I'm really looking totally forward agree. So I finally found a, a, a <clears throat> I finally found something positive about being over 65 years old. Uh, not that easy. Other than Medicare, it's not that easy to find things that are positive. But I, I got my second vaccine shot on uh, uh, last Friday. So uh, I was real glad to see the CDC recommendations modified yesterday so that uh, at least some portion of us can start to get back to some degree of normal. Right. Agree. And I've got eight grandkids, so I have a pretty personal reason to be supportive of what the CDC he said yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and uh, I'm Commissioner Dave Mills, uh, representing District uh, 3 here in Cook County, and this is my third year on the board. And um, one of, uh, we've got three new commissioners and, and two, uh, I mean, I don't feel old by, well, <laughs> I guess in some, some senses I can f start to feel older, but you know, it's all relative. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we got a, a pretty new board here and I think in general Cook County has a, a newer board, um, just from hearing from AMC, uh, you know, commissioners having 20 some years under their belt. That's, that's not something we've, we've had in recent times here. So, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to visit with us and, and really appreciate the work that you do. And, um, we, we certainly have open ears just to hear what, what you see as some of the larger challenges going on in the state and, and in the region too. Oh, by the way, how did how did your second shot go? Did it stay on your feet or were you out for the count for a bit? Or I did not feel a thing. I got on my Polaris Ranger uh, the next morning and went, puttered around the lake, uh, went over to a friend's house for a little uh, uh, fire and some happy hour a couple miles down the lake. I, I was 
My wife got, because she got it at the same time I did Friday. She was a little bit under the weather on Saturday, but I never felt a thing. My arm wasn't even sore. So I guess I was wow. one of the lucky ones. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's interesting how it all affects us differently. Um, even getting it the same day, same age, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, well, I'm happy to hear you. It didn't hit, hit you too bad. Um, well, we also have um, uh, HR Director Pamela Dixon here. I don't know if, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I don't know if you've had a chance to meet Senator Bach before. I have not. Um, my name is Pamela Dixon. I'm the HR Director here for Cook County, and I have been here for about a year and a half. Nice to meet you. No, no, thank you. And then um, we have Administrative Assistant uh, April Zimmer on the line as well. Um, don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself, April. Welcome, Senator. I'm April Zimmer. I've been with the county for about uh, a little over two years now. I'm glad to have you with us today. Well, thanks. Thanks for what you're doing, directing traffic for everybody, because it, it takes a lot of spokes in the wheel to make everything work. So. Thank you. Absolutely. And Adriana Brisson as well um, is a, a, a new employee who um, Commissioner Hawkins was actually an employee for Cook County and now Adriana has has um, that position. So I uh, let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Adriana Brisson. I only started in January, so I'm very new to the crew, but learning lots and enjoying every minute of it. Thank you for being here. And then Auditor Powers as well, who I'm not sure you've met before, but uh, Brady, go ahead. Hi, Senator Bach. Um, my guess is that I've been here longer than all of the combined years of everyone else who introduced themselves this morning. So, 1991. I, I, find my, I find myself in the same kind of position, Brady, down here. I. I was in the local government committee this morning via Zoom, and I, I made the very same statement. I've been in the Minnesota legislature longer than all of you committee members combined. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of lot of changes, lot of lot, lots happening and going on, and uh, yeah, it can it, it's important for us to have you know experienced leaders and experienced staff to, to help us navigate all our uh, us new people navigate all everything so well yeah his, his, his i mean historical perspectives on things are important uh and i see it here at the legislature all the time you know we all we all think we we know something until you get elected to higher office and you find out oh my gosh there's a lot i didn't know anything about so uh having some continuity is very very important yeah. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. We don't have uh, necessarily specific, uh, you know, agenda or questions for you. Do you want to kind of give more of an overview of, of what's on your mind and what's been going on at the state and in the region? Or you sure. can fish for questions here, too, afterwards. Be happy to. And yeah, I want to I won't take too much time. I, I've got four different bills up in committee today, so I'm kind of strapped. But uh, you kind of lose control of your calendar and when you start bumping up against committee deadlines, because if, if for instance, if you've got a, a, a bill you want to move here that's policy related, if it's not heard in the House or Senate by this Friday, it for all practical purposes, it's dead for the year. So we have deadlines like that in order to, to build a timeline to get out of here when we constitutionally have to, which is May 17th. I guess first, let me say thank you for all of, to all of you that are, are are new or relatively new uh, to elected office and staff levels in county government. I, uh, people that know me will tell you I value deeply local government officials because you're much closer to the constituents than those of us that spend a, a large part of our life in St. Paul. So uh, it, when, when county boards weigh in with resolutions or letters supporting something or asking for something, I just want you to know I take it very seriously. So thanks for your willingness to do that. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to your family members for allowing you to do it. Uh, elective office is uh, more of a contact sport than, a, than it has been in recent years. And oftentimes family members uh, get drug into that, whether it's at the grocery store or the post office or, or, or wherever it is. And you know they didn't pay the hundred bucks and sign up for it, but oftentimes 
uh, they end up being as involved in public service as the individual that was elected. So to all of, all of you have family members, uh, go home and thank them tonight for being supportive because it's very hard to serve and be effective in these elective offices without a supportive families. Uh, well, this is a budget year. That is the uh, overriding work of this session. We're gonna pass a, a new two-year budget, uh, hopefully by May 17th. That is constitutionally the day that we have, uh, we have to adjourn. Uh, we have the budget numbers that we need right now. Uh, the, the governor in law has to submit a budget by the fourth Tuesday in January. He did that. Uh, the legislature uh, has a little bit of an advantage on a governor in that we really don't start working on our budget until we have the most updated uh, budget forecast numbers uh, from our forecasting agency. And that came this year on February 26th. That generally comes right at the end of February or the first couple of days of March. And the uh, economy has, I don't know if it's taken as much of a, uh, probably hasn't changed that much. Our revenue changed quite a bit from the November forecast that the governor had to work with. But it really large, not, not so much because the economy changed, uh, but because of the federal stimulus dollars coming in have helped prop up the economy quite a bit. Uh, absent that December stimulus bill and the one that's gonna pass now uh, and likely be signed by President Biden this week, uh, our budget forecast uh, is assuming there's a $1.5 trillion bill that's gonna be passed by the federal government so our, our numbers have turned around some. We uh, were forecasting about a billion, a little over a billion dollars of one-time money available over the next two years and four months. And uh, for the next budget cycle, it starts July 1st, ongoing money, uh, we, we have about $260 million. So if, to, to give you an example, if we put, uh, spend about $100 million uh, a year, which is not a lot of money in, in the context of a, of a $52 billion budget. Uh, if we spent it and then in, in the next biennium, it happens twice because it happens in two different years, we'd kind of be out of money. So there's not a lot of uh, ongoing money to put into programs that reoccur. That's a little bit of a challenge, uh, but there is quite a bit of one-time money to be able to do things uh, that uh, you know maybe we otherwise couldn't have done because everything you want to do here has to compete uh, every, every two years for uh, priorities in all the different committees, whether it's transportation or health and human services or education or higher ed or uh, aids and credits over the tax committee, things like you know county program aid and local government aid to cities everything kind of gets put into competition. So uh, there's not gonna be a lot of money to compete for for those kind of ongoing uh, needs that people have, uh, but there's enough one-time money to, to pretty, do some pretty significant things, I think, with, uh, and kind of near the top of the list for me, of course, public safety, I think is everyone's number one concern. Uh, and you know, much of that is carried out at the local government level. So making sure that the state maintains a strong partnership with local governments is very, very important because uh, it's really where public safety happens largely. Uh, but it's a, there is enough one-time money that I think there's a good opportunity to expand broadband. And I know in, in Cook County uh, through Airwood Co-op and the federal help you got have done an outstanding job of getting uh, very, very good internet service, pretty much to everybody in the county that wants to have it. But you are really an exception. That is not the case everywhere. And I can just tell you, my own school district, the St. Louis County Rural Schools, you know, we've got a school just north of Duluth. We've got another one just on the south side of the Iron Range in Cherry. We've got one between Cook and Ord. We've got another one over in Babbitt, you know, about 2,000, 2,200 kids in there. When they had to go to distance learning, the school superintendent told me that 80% of the households were underserved. And that, uh, so the, the, the issue with schools and kids having to distance learn, I think really
put a lot of additional emphasis on the fact that there are a lot of areas in the state that really do not have, that have either none or, or very minimal broadband service. So we did uh, last fall, um, Minnesota received uh, a chunk of federal money, I think about $400 million over six or eight years that's gonna be coming in. And uh, I, have a, I have a bill this year for 120 million of state money over the next two years. They're again, one-time money. So I think it has a pretty good chance to get over the finish line. The question kind of is gonna be how it does state money dovetail with uh, the federal money that's coming. Uh, some areas are, you know, we have to have a willing provider that's willing to, uh, to build out the service. And some areas just don't have the kind of density like Cook County. I mean, you ended up with Airwood Co-op rather than, than uh, a, a traditional provider, private provider coming in because it just wasn't going to happen. Private provider had to do it. So uh, some areas are going to be harder to get to than others. Uh, so figuring out how we dove sales from state money along with the federal money coming in uh, is going to be, I think, a little tricky because we don't have, you know, they, we haven't opened up the application process yet to even know where the federal money is going to get used. But that's a, a, a pretty high priority for me. My, uh, you know, we're always at the risk of saying what your what your most important bill is, but I, I can tell you I've got a bill that I think we're probably going to take up on the Senate floor Thursday. And you all know business owners who've got federal help through the Paytech Paycheck Protection Program, PPP. And I think when most people took that help from the federal government, those forgivable loans, uh, they believed that they were going to be tax free, uh, that they weren't going to have to pay taxes on that loan if it was forgiven. So that's what they that's what the federal government said. But uh, turns out, current law in Minnesota, those loans, uh, forgivable loans, are taxable. So starting uh, or next Monday, March 15th, when businesses have to file their taxes, if you had one of those PPP loans, you're going to owe Minnesota uh, income taxes or, or in individual or corporate income taxes on those uh, loan proceeds. I just think that's a huge problem. One, you know, businesses made decisions to try and build their business back, bring people back to work. Uh, I think with the assumption that they weren't going to have to pay taxes on the money, not only to find out they made the decision, spent the money ramping up their business model, not only to find out, oh my gosh, I got to pay Minnesota taxes on the money. So I think if we don't find a way to ex exclude those from Minnesota taxes, on Monday, there's about $411 million due from the business community to the Minnesota Department of Revenue. That's the tax on those $11 billion of federal loans that came to Minnesota. Uh, that, if that $400 million gets parked over the Department of Revenue, it's not going to be in our economy. And uh, what is a little bit silly about it is I think in the end, those loans are going to be tax exempt. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's some people want to use it like a bargaining chip in the end of session negotiations, and oftentimes important things get used that way, so it's not unusual. Uh, but it just seems a little silly to me to have businesses pay the Department of Revenue $411 million next Monday, only in uh, the end of May to have it refunded back to them. So uh, we're going to pass the bill, I think, Thursday. We've been waiting for the federal stimulus bill to get signed so that we know for sure how that's going to interact with the decisions that we make in Minnesota. So I'm hoping to be able to get that done this week. The, the House isn't, uh, hasn't shown it to be as strong a priority as the Senate has, um, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. I, I'm hoping, I, I'm, I'm wishing the governor would have would have publicly weighed in and said something on this subject, but he hasn't. And unfortunately, and I, I, I think because of the timing of his budget, he wasn't able to put it in his budget proposal to the legislature. So he has not proposed exempting those loans from Minnesota taxes. Um, but we'll see kind of how that goes. So the first committee deadline is this Friday. Uh, what that means, if you've got some kind of a policy bill that has to pass either one of the two chambers, the House or, or committees, either in the House or the Senate, 
if it didn't get, uh, if, it did, if it got hurt in one by this Friday, it has next week, one more week, to get hurt in the other body uh, and passed out of committee. And then, uh, then it's alive. But uh, so we're coming up to the point where things are gonna kind of hit the cutting room floor. I think most policy things probably aren't gonna get done this year. It's just too challenging an environment trying to do this virtually. Issues that have any controversy around them, there just isn't uh, time to be able to bring people together and find consensus on controversial things. So the main emphasis of the, of the year is going to be on the, the budget. Uh, the other issue, uh, and I'm actually on the uh, tax committee, I stayed on the tax committee, I've been on it for a long, long time. Uh, I, 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 I made a decision to be on the redistricting committee. This legislature is going to draw maps that shape the legislative districts and the state's congressional districts that we'll live under for the next 10 years. Uh, so I'm on that committee so that I can kind of keep an eye on what's happening around the state relative to uh, you know, what those districts look like, how many there are, who gets paired uh, up. And that always happens. There'll be some legislators paired. We might even have a member of Congress paired this year if, uh, if we don't have enough people in the census count. We may go from eight to seven members of Congress. So that'll be a pretty significant change in those districts. So I wanted to be part of that uh, process. I stayed on the Senate Rules Committee. That's the committee that actually is the administrative body of the Senate that determines what our rules are. Uh, and then I'm the chair of the Capital Investment Committee. That's the committee that does uh, all the public infrastructure bonding. Uh, I expect we'll have a relatively small bill this year. Uh, this is the, normally in the budget year, it's a pretty small bill, um, mostly focused around emergency type things uh, next year. So come, come uh, August, we'll take the committee and start toying around the state looking at projects uh, for potential inclusion in a much larger bonding bill uh, next session. So that's kind of what uh, my calendar is going to look like. So for now, I'm just trying to move bills that uh, are most of them are related to the district. The bills that I have, you know, the PPP and the PPP and the broadband bill, not so much. Those are more statewide bills. Uh, but most of what I have are requests from local governments uh, for for things they need uh, some legislation passed for. Uh, some of it is in the workforce development uh, area. Uh, I, I've got another one that puts some additional money into our small two-year colleges because they're really really struggling. Uh, so we're trying to trying to move all of those things along in, in what is a difficult session because we're having to do it all virtually. So that's kind of what, uh, what what's happening down here. There's uh, almost no snow left on the ground for those of you that care. It's been pretty pretty warm here, uh, also. And of course, the big thing in the news right now around uh, the, the Twin Cities and probably statewide, but is the Derek Chauvin trial in, in Minneapolis. And there were about a thousand protesters out on the street in Minneapolis yesterday and, and you know, ex ex exercising their first amendment rights. And there were uh, uh, no kind of disturbances of any kind. So everything went pretty smoothly. So hopefully things can stay that way as we find our way through this. Uh, we, the Senate yesterday did pass a bill that provided about $20 million of uh, potential relief to cities that are impacted uh, to cover some of the costs of, uh, you know, putting up the fencing, uh, the police overtime and things that are going to be need needed. This, you know, it's probably, it may, it may be May before we actually get a verdict in the trial. And, and then, you know, there may be, depending on what the outcome of that is, uh, some lingering public safety issues uh, going forward. But we've got a real challenge on our hands how we deal with, especially Minneapolis, not as much St. Paul. Uh, the, the crime has become a significant problem. I mean, carjackings are through the roof uh, and uh, the homicide rate is high, is back at the level of, was last at this level back in like 1996. It's a serious problem. There's a 
there's a kind of a sentiment on the street down here that these big cities aren't safe and we, we have to figure out how uh, how we mitigate that because uh, you know we need we need thriving big cities these these cities are very, very important to the economy of the state our big fortune 500 companies are all headquartered here uh, we have to make sure that their employees can get in and get to work every day and feel safe that you know, when the twin season opens, people uh, feel safe coming to downtown Minneapolis to go to a ball game. So uh, I, I often say, you know, public safety is probably the most important thing that those of us in government do. And historically, we've done such a good job at it that really no one even thinks about it, but not so much right now. So we, we've got to restore public confidence that our, that our streets are safe. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about about that so uh, you know nothing bad happens here and people get people get hurt so that's kind of what we're we're trying to get our arms around i'd be happy to take questions well thank you senator bach um do doesn't do any commissioners have uh some questions for for the senator chairman mills yeah commissioner storley Yes, um, thank you, Senator Bach. Um, I'm just kind of keeping my eye on what uh, potentially could be happening with um, absentee uh, ballot voting. I know that it probably isn't anything that will be dealt with this year, but next year we'll be going into a primary and I'm concerned about how the state is gonna handle that. Well, I don't, I don't think you're gonna see any changes. Uh, there's bills floating around in Minnesota and all over the place all over the country on, on putting some restrictions on absentee uh, voting. The, the, the only thing that Secretary Simon actually did uh, in this election cycle that's not specified in law was he allowed people to vote absentee without a witness signing their ballot. And that was done for COVID purposes. I'm not sure that needs to be the case uh, going forward, but you know, the integrity of our election system is pretty strong. Uh, you know, I remember back when uh, Al Franken was originally elected, uh, I don't know what year that even was, Norm Coleman ran against him and he didn't actually, you know, the election was in November. He didn't actually get swore into the, to the U.S. Senate until spring. I think it was probably April as we went through and recounted every ballot. And we counted all the ballots in the state multiple times. And I think there were seven discrepancies and those ballots were scrubbed big time. So, and, and I think the fact that there were a number of election challenges filed in states all around the country uh, that no judge was presented with any credible information that showed there was uh, any fraudulent behavior at the ballot box. So. I think, you know, it, it's as scrutinized that this election was, we all should feel pretty good about our system. I don't, I don't believe it needs any changes. Uh, so we'll, we'll just, un unfortunately, you know, people are trying to play politics with it. That's just the nature of politics, I guess. And, and, uh, and kind of shape a narrative around something's broken. Uh, I don't personally happen to believe that, but there are, this whole social media environment that we're in is really, it, it's really changing the landscape. And, and I don't know how many of you have Netflix, but I just recently watched a, a documentary on there called Social Dilemma. Uh, let me just suggest that, that if you kind of want to get a little feeling and, and kind of question a little bit all the social media coming at us, it's worth taking a look at. Uh, you know, so much of what we see come at us now is not accurate and it's not fact-checked. And, and in, in, even our regular news these days have seemed to have gotten some bias one way or the other. So uh, I think we all need uh, to spend a little more time digesting facts before we come to conclusions on them. But I don't, I don't think anything's going to happen on the election front. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Commissioner Storley and, and Senator Bach. Do, do any other commissioners have questions? Commissioner Hawkins. <clears throat> well, actually not questions per se, but encouragement. I guess there are three issues that I want to make sure that 
you guys know are important to Cook County and the citizens of Minnesota. Um, health and human services waivers. <laughs> there are some good things that came out of this pandemic we've learned. We want to make sure those kinds of opportunities continue. Um, the second, housing. And it's a statewide issue. You know, there's quite a few bills you're going to be considering. I know I was reading up on that. A really important topic. Along with broadband, I get it, Senator Bach, yes. Important for all of Minnesota. Um, and the next one that I wanna make sure, I know the governor's budget was presented early, but his initial budget made cuts to um, corrections Community, and community corrections is really important for our area. So I wanna make sure that you're advocating for no funding cuts for community corrections and especially for parole services. So that's just my two cents. Sure, well, thank you. I appreciate the input. I, uh, I don't believe any tax increases are gonna come out of this session. I just don't think that's gonna happen. And, and there's enough time, one-time money and we've got about one point $8 billion in our budget reserve. Uh, I, mean, I think we can put a budget together. It maybe won't satisfy everybody's wants, uh, but maybe we're at a period of time right now where if everybody gets what they need, that's the best outcome that we're gonna get. Uh, so everything's gonna get scrutinized uh, some. Uh, there are some decisions in the governor's budget. I have no idea why they're there. I, I assume uh, that uh, you know, for instance, uh, he, he made a decision to cut uh, some programs over at the University of Minnesota relative to research on spinal cord injuries. He has been doing a lot of work on that. I don't know why that's in his budget that he would cut that, uh, but I'm assuming he had conversations with the U. Sometimes things really on its face don't look like they make a lot of sense, but governor generally put a lot of thought into their budgets and, and uh not always, but generally uh, things are in there for a reason. So we just have to learn more about his budget as it gets taken through the legislative process through the different committees. Uh, but I, I think our economy is uh, pretty badly shaken. Uh, a lot of our businesses are uh, teetering on the edge of whether they're gonna make it or not. And uh, I just don't think it's a good time to be asking for tax increases. I also think they're very hard to sell to the public when the perception is that we're running a budget surplus. I think it's very hard to get the, even though, you know, I know it's all one-time money and there, we're going to be, there's limited things we can do on that, that most people don't drill down into kind of what those numbers mean. And I wouldn't expect them to. So uh, I think getting the public to accept the tax increase would be, pretty difficult right now. So I think we'll cobble, we'll, we'll cobble a budget together that won't be everything everybody wants. But I, I think the, the one place I think that are gonna be fine in this whole thing is local governments. Uh, I don't believe there'll be any cuts in any state funding local governments. And uh, uh, there's certainly some help coming with the federal government from the federal government in this stimulus bill that are gonna help help units of government and, and, and schools in a significant way. I tell you what, I have a bill up in the Environment Finance Committee, so I need to, I, I normally I would say hustle down to the committee room, but I just got to change Zoom screens right now. So hopefully we can do this in person next year. Uh, everybody, please be safe. And uh, thanks again for the work in the mm -hmm. of Cook County. Thank you very Thank much, you. Senator Bach. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. You too. And. Uh, Excellent timing. We have Representative Eklund on, on the Zoom meeting now as well. Um, and Senator Bach joined early and, and we did uh, introductions kind of around the Zoom room here. Um, okay. And uh, and if it's okay with you, we could just do that again. Um, yeah, that works for me. There's some new faces and, and some, some yeah. familiar faces too. So let's, let's do that, uh, Chair. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'll just go around my screen here. Uh, Commissioner Salson. Yes, good morning and welcome. <clears throat> My name is Bob Swallison. I was elected to represent District 1 in a special election in February of this year. Uh, the special election was brought on when, uh, when Bobby Deshaw decided to run and was, uh, was elected to be the, the chairman of the Grand Portage. So 
Um, I feel honored to fill this position and represent District 1 here. And nice thank you for being pleasure. with us. And Commissioner Sullivan. Good morning, Representative Eklund. Ann Sullivan, I was elected in November to District 4 here in Cook County. Thank you for being here today. Nice to meet you. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins. Good morning, I'm Commissioner Hawkins, District 2, newly elected, first year. I'm excited to have you here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, nice to meet you. Uh, Commissioner Storley. Um, good morning. I'm a familiar face. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to do this. Wish we could be, you know, in person, but hopefully next year we can do that. Hopefully next year, maybe even this summer. You never know. It's good never to see know. You. Good <laughs> to see you again, Commissioner. <laughs> yep. And uh, I'm Commissioner Dave Mills, uh, representing District 3. This is my third year as a uh, commissioner. Uh, as you can see and tell we've got three new commissioners and and two quote unquote old um but our 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 board is quite young all in all um we also have a number of staff here uh, present uh, attorney hicken uh good morning miss uh, representative eckland molly hicken cook county attorney good to see you good to see you again and then we have administrative assistant april zimmer Good morning, Representative uh, April Zimmer. Been with the county for a little over two years. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me on Thursday. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be with here with us today. Did the other two books come, April? Um, not yet, probably today, I assume. Okay, there, there should be in the mail, so. I appreciate it, thank you. And then we have Adriana Brisson. Hi, I'm Adriana Brisson, new to the crew as well. I only started in January, but I am really enjoying my time here and looking forward to working with everyone more. And thank you so much for being here. Well, welcome aboard. And we have Auditor Powers. Hi, Representative Eklund. Um, I've just been here since the year 2000. Um, looking forward to a couple more. Thanks for being here. Good to see you again, Brady. There was a there was a time discrepancy that I caught there. I thought in the last conversation you said ninety one, Brady. <laughs> well, elected in two thousand. Ah, fair enough. Uh, then we have uh, then, then we have um, our human resource director Pamela Dixon on on the call. Good morning, Representative Eklund. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And then we have our uh, administrator, James Yorkie. Good morning, Representative Eklund. Uh, I'm James Yorkie. I'm the county administrator. I've been in the job since October. And I spoke to you in, in December when the, when the uh, legislature was passing the uh, COVID relief bill. Really appreciate the assistance that you provided to us in that. And uh, really glad to have you here this morning. Thank you. Welcome to, welcome to Cook County, Mr. Yorkie. You're going to enjoy it. So, oh, yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, do you want me to start off with what committees I'm on and what legislation I'm working on? Is that I, I kind of caught the tail end of Senator Box, and I can certainly, I can certainly do that. So. Yeah, um, well, we, we don't have a, a specific agenda or a specific list of questions. I'm sure uh, commissioners do have some, some questions, um, but I'll leave it to you to how you'd like to proceed. Um, kind of how I left it with Senator Bach was, Please, uh, you know, let us know what's what's on the top of your mind uh, down at the Capitol as well as in the region and just whatever whatever priorities you'd like to speak of. And, and we'll, okay. we'll ask questions as we go. So thank you very sure. much. That works. So I'll start off quickly with my committees. I sit on the Environment, Finance and Policy Committee. Um, I think that's uh, a really a critical committee that the person from this district has traditionally sat on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful I'm on there for, for a lot of reasons. We need to make sure that we take care of our environment however possible. And in the meantime, making sure that the state moves forward with, with uh, some of the things that we need to move forward on as far as the environment goes. I also sit on the Ag Finance and Policy Committee. That's an that's a interesting one for, my, for our, my district, our area of life. There is not a lot of ag in, in, uh, in our district, but there is getting to be more um, uh, organic gardening, 
organic eggs, so it's getting to be a bigger thing. I think of uh, my good friend uh, David Boz has the farm down in Finland, supplies a lot of the produce to the, to many of the many of the establishments on the shore. So he's proving that that it can be done, and I and I'm that's one of the things I I really enjoyed working on is how we can start developing that industry for northeastern Minnesota. Um, the probably the the committee I'm proudest to be on is the one I'm chairing. I'm chairing the labor industry and veterans affairs finance and policy committee it sounds like a kind of a funny combination but uh the sad thing about it is i'm the only efl vet left in the minnesota house of representatives efl caucus so wherever i was going whatever committee i was uh in line to chair veterans was going with it so that's why it's part of the labor and industry committee and as most of you know i've got a long long history in the labor movement uh 29 you're a member of the steel workers, past president, past organizer. I've, I've done a lot of that stuff over the years. So the, the labor and industry part of this job is uh, near and dear to my heart as well. So being able to have both those, uh, being a vet and being a longtime union member, it's a, it's a, it's an honor to be able to chair that committee. And then probably the big committee I'm on is Ways and Means, and Ways and Means is where all the finance goes through that committee before it goes to either the House floor or to the uh, various uh, <coughs> omnibus budgets that we that we omnibus bills that we try to put together. So it's kind of, it's uh it's real interesting sitting on that committee because that's that's where all the money is spent. Um, my are, are proposed to be spent. Obviously, we <laughs> get the agreement from the other body too. Uh, my priorities this year, I, I I basically have three simple priorities. One of them, uh, I've worked on this bill. Uh, the number one is broadband. Uh, Cook County is very fortunate in the broadband they have and, and fortunate in what Arrowhead Electric did a few years ago along with the members to uh, get the broadband in the county that has. It has some of the best in the state, which is uh, is really something that we can, that you can be proud of. But uh, right now, there's still 157,000 households in the state of Minnesota that are unserved by broadband. So. Senator Bach and I are the chief authors of $120 million border border broadband grant bill. Um, I'm not naive enough to think that we're gonna get $120 million, but if we get something, it'll help push forward uh, uh, developing more broadband. And the federal government with these past COVID packages there is kicking in big on the broadband uh, front as well. So I'm hopeful that, that within the next few years that our some of our broadband issues will be uh, addressed, but Part of the trouble with uh, supplying it or providing it is we're at, we're at the point now in a lot of places where you're a, a quarter mile or half mile between mailboxes, and that's that's where it gets to be the real challenge is getting fiber in the ground uh, and having to move that distance. That's that's what we're that's that's where our next challenge is. Um, this this doesn't have anything to do with the district, but uh, we've been working for three years to get a vet, Veterans Restorative Justice Act bill, attorney. Uh, County Attorney, I don't know if you'll appreciate that or not, but it, it'll it'll it. Uh, our veterans go to go to war. We send them to war in multiple uh, multiple uh, uh, events, and then uh, it seems like when they get out, we're not ready to, to take care of them. So this this bill will help veterans uh, reassimilate assimilate back into society after they found themselves on the wrong side of the law, and it deals strictly with level level seven offenses and below, which my understanding is. A lot of times those offenses, uh, at least initially, are, are eligible for probation in the first place. I, I'm not sure if I got that quite right for the county attorney, but I think I'm pretty close on that. And so I, uh, that's a priority. I, I carried the bill the last two years, and I got uncomfortable getting in front of judiciary at, and public safety to answer for legal questions. So um, one of my new colleagues this year, uh, Representative Sandra Price, has agreed to take over that bill. She's an immigration attorney and is a big believer in multiple social justice programs, so uh, uh, restorative justice programs, I, I'm sorry. And so she's taking that bill and she's running with it. And I think we'll get it done. And the third thing I want to uh, address, the main thing I think we need to do is PPP tax conformity with the federal government. Um, our businesses are taking enough of a hit right now. I don't think that they should be taxed at that 9.8% on PPP loans that they took out. And, and I know that's moving in the Senate and Chair Marquardt, the tax chair in the House, is carrying that bill. So I'm hoping, hopefully, that we'll, we'll see that conformity. Um, and then finally, this is always an overall uh, uh, priority. I do work, I think most of you know that I do work hard for our district. Uh, your concerns of the 
municipal uh, municipalities concerns the county's concerns um i i think i do a, a provide a good job of bringing that uh that message down to the legislature so with that i will stop and see if you guys have any questions Thank you, Representative Eklund. Yeah, I think you do a great job too, uh, representing us and, and bringing our concerns to the forefront uh, when we got them. So thank you. Um, do any commissioners have any questions or, or comments for Representative Eklund? Come on, you guys are too easy. Commissioner Sullivan. Yes, I just wanted to um, make a comment um, regarding the clean water fund appropriations. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And there was uh, recently a new provision to allow counties to add a fee, a $25 deed and mortgage fee that would be directed to local soil and water. And after attending our local soil and water meeting, um, there's strong opposition to that. And I know AMC has also um, indicated they are opposed to that, but um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. So then, and thanks commissioner, I appreciate that. So, so what's going on there is the soil and water conservation districts have been funded out of the clean water fund for basically since it's been started when we voted in, in the tax, uh, the Sard Sam's uh, uh, three sixteenths of a percent sales tax to fund these things. That's due to sunset in about 12 years. And we don't know if it'll be reapproved by the voters. I'm certainly hopeful it will. I think that, uh, I think that uh, legacy funding and other stuff has, been, has had a tremendous impact on the state. However, if it's not, we'll be looking at about $12 million, $12 million a year that have been going to SWCDs for funding that will have to be made up somewhere else. So what Chair Hansen's trying to do is, is uh, start a conversation about how we go forward funding the SWCDs because we all know how important they are to all of our counties, especially our small rural counties. They're, they're a lot of times the first person that we can talk to about uh, wetland issues or riparian issues or, or any of that kind of stuff. So they do need to be funded. We're just trying to have a conversation about how it's gonna be funded. I expect when all this is said and done, we'll be funding the SWCDs for the next two years of biennium again out of the Clean Water Fund. But uh, without that other stuff, but I, I actually applaud Representative Hansen for thinking about this and trying to figure out different ways to uh, provide funding, whether that's the right way or not. It's a, it's a conversation starter anyway. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Any other questions or concerns for Representative Eklund? Life is good. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I, I certainly can bring up some more meta stuff. Uh, um, I, I was, I, I'm really pleased that both you and Senator Bach uh, are, you know, are, and you've been focused on broadband since since you were elected. You you recognize the importance there, and and yeah, Cook County is very unique in that we, we're by and large covered, um, and yeah, the challenges in the more rural settings, yeah, just the pure mileage, you know, yeah. makes makes that very challenging and. And so I'd, I'd uh, you know, I encourage you to, to keep pushing on that. Um, I think it's critical. I, I see it as basically a, just a, a basic utility like electricity or, or water, and, um, and just to, just to be able to stay competitive and whether it be schools or, or distance learning or remote work or you have it, uh, it's that's important. But um, one one of the things I wanted to bring up is just that there are other options beyond the fiber. Um, and and that's something I use, and it does have its uh, drawbacks, as everyone here can can attest to, and, and that's just the satellite internet. Um, a beta, I'm a beta user of uh, the Elon Musk Starlink system, and and uh, I know there's a number uh, kind of in our area who are off grid or not able to connect to fiber, and it's worked by and large very well. It got us through the whole distance learning period, and and allows me to to connect uh, as I am now. Um, but it's just uh, something to consider when we're when we're doling out money just what could be most cost effective especially when we're talking those long distance uh, rural settings so i'm not saying that's what we should be doing but just as long as we're looking at the whole picture is is what i'm most concerned about um and, and, there, and there's nothing in our broadband funding request that that precludes satellite companies from putting in a yeah. grant proposal that, that they're available to do that one of the things that they do have uh, trouble with on, on satellite 
internet is some companies don't allow their employees to use it because of uh, because of some security issues. But uh, like everything in technology, that'll that'll move forward. And we've got an ex- interesting one going on over in Ely. It's called Treehouse Communications, and they are providing broadband through line of sight from the Ely Water Tower to the uh, uh, township of Morris out around Burnside Lake. Three hundred and some uh, customers when they're all said and done. And uh, they are, he is claiming that he will make state broadband speeds with line of sight. So if he can do that, I'm thinking it'll have a real application for other areas, especially maybe farming communities and others where we have lots of uh, silos and other taller, taller structures that, that maybe will we'll provide that. Time. So it'll be interesting to see how that shapes out and whether we can figure out how to move that into the broadband portfolio too. Yeah, great. Yeah, just just those kinds of ideas I think are really important when we're when we're trying to figure this, yeah. this stuff out. Um, one of the, one of the other things that's um, I'm just curious about is just uh, the laws around virtual meetings and if that's being discussed at all. Um, I think a lot of our committees can just do it um, because they're not necessarily um, public meetings, but. Um, you know, I think I think in in the remote areas who do have broadband, like Cook County, it's a real boon for us not to need to travel as much. And so, I'm not sure if there's there's things that are can be talked about or looked at in the future. There, maybe not this session necessarily, but just an, another idea to bring bring up the list here. I I expect after we get off the uh, off done with the budget this year, that next year being uh, generally a policy year, that we're going to start seeing a lot of that type of things. And as most of you know, I'm a former county commissioner. I was commissioning county commissioner for five years before I did this. And I can see for our rural counties where these virtual meetings are got to be saving you guys a few bucks just in travel. It's it's got to be it's got to be really something. Because I I can remember uh, wondering about why I drove two hours for a one hour meeting and then turn around and drove home. That that really made no sense for me time wise or anything like that. So I. Uh, there's some meetings that we have to have in person. Uh, Senator Bach talked about our committee process. It's tremendously, tremendously frustrating. Uh, but I think I think the, this pandemic has shown that we can uh, we can make some savings and make some adjustments to how we do things as well. So we'll we'll see how that shakes out next year. I know every committee meeting, hearing I start, I almost have it memorized now. It's uh, we're holding this in uh, line with. Uh, House Rules 10.01 that allows us to have these virtual meetings and that sort of thing. I'm going to start out that way, but it's uh, I think it's something that uh, at least on a smaller setting is going to be beneficial, especially to our like like Cook County and Cushion County and Lake County that folks have to travel so far sometimes for some of these meetings. So. Yep. Yeah, I figured you you could relate and you know exactly <laughs> what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, well, and, and then, you know, just getting to the bigger picture here, and, and this is not something I expect you to be able to attack or, or solve, but just something that, that Senator Bach brought up that we didn't really get to and something that was kind of on my short list is just the um, the holistic health uh, of our society as far as the division and, uh, and conflicts and how we resolve those. And I just see a lot of uh, a lot of problems, whether they be around public safety or there are the schools or there are, are roads and bridges. There's there's just a lot going on, and every single issue, um, it it really brings out strong emotions. And so it's really hard to pinpoint one particular topic or one particular cause or anything like that. But I'm I'm just hoping that that our our leadership um you know at the county level at the state level at the national level can can really try to brainstorm ways to to make this better and to to kind of heal up this this dysfunction and um I don't know if if there's committees looking at that at the state level or or if you've got any just spitball ideas or anything like that or if there's something concrete going on I I'd, I'd love to hear about it but that's I I think that's a, a root to a lot of our problems well, and 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 I and I hope I don't step on any toes here when I say this, but I, I think if you take a look at what we have going on nationally, I think our president right now is going to be a lot more of a calming influence on our country than uh, than our previous president was. Uh, I don't think you see all the drama. I don't think you see that President Biden has to be front and center on everything because you could let people do the job that they're hired to do and elected to do. Uh, I agree.
agree with you, Commissioner, wholeheartedly that it seems like every issue that we have right now is somebody's breaking point, and, it, and it's it's tremendously frustrating to be in that position to have to have that happen. So let's let's give it some time. Uh, President uh, Biden's only been in office for uh, 46 days or whatever it is now, and and uh, hopefully that hopefully we that calming influence will stretch down to us. But I'm I'm uh, very saddened that uh, Washington style politics has come to the state of Minnesota in the legislature. And I think if you watch any of our committee hearings, um, you'll see a lot of that. I used to tell people watch committees because that's where things really get done. But uh, whether it's a combination of doing this thing remotely and people's uh, emotions are frayed and all that kind of stuff, but it's uh, it's uh, a, a tremendous challenge to try to get through some of this work that we're trying to do. Yeah. Absolutely, and we're this, these are unprecedented times, and we're dealing, we're all dealing with a whole heck of a lot. So, uh, yeah. all the factors just compound, and yeah, no, it's it's there's no easy fix, and it will take time. And I, I certainly appreciate your perspective there. Well, any any other commissioners have questions or comments? Now that I stirred the pot, <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with a little pot stirring. That, that 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 helps get things done. I don't mind that at all. So. Well, no one else is, is speaking up, uh, but we, I, I want to thank you for, for joining us. And Commissioner Storley was uh, the one who, who really suggested we do this because we did not get a chance to, to meet with you down at down St. Paul. So I want to thank her as well. Yeah, and I, and I was going to try to put something in the chat, but if you guys want to jot down my cell phone number, that's the only number I have. Don't hesitate to get a hold of me. So it's 218 uh, 341 Six one three three. Thank you. And I think I have Ginny's, but I, I, I uh, Commissioner Mills, I don't think I got your, I've gotten yours yet or any, but just somebody send me a text and I'll and I'll respond. We'll get you in the in the. But I that's the only way I can uh, be in contact. I don't my my uh, legislative assistant takes care of all my phone calls that come into the office and she relays that information to me. So that this is my only phone line I have. So. And you're okay, very good you about very returning much. calls. What's that? You're very good about returning calls too. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that's a critical part of my job. If a commissioner or a constituent or a city councilor gets a hold of me, or or the county attorney for that matter, if if well, if you want to call me, but anyway, no, it's I, I, I think that is a critical part of my job to return calls when you guys reach out to me. So, thank you, thank yeah. you so much, Representative Eckland, and. Uh, I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day and, and stay strong and, and healthy and uh, look forward to talking again soon. Yeah, I have two bills up today, one in environment and one in uh, one in uh, my committee. So it should pass, my, mine should pass out of my committee. I would hope so anyway, but uh, <laughs> things things will be good. The one I'm doing in environment is on chronic waste and disease for any deer hunters out there. I'm working, that's one of the things I'm really working hard on is uh, trying to slow back the spread of that. So. And I hope that uh, I, I, I've kind of got a tradition. We didn't do it last year, obviously, because of COVID. But I, uh, I like to come up and have a have a meeting with the board, hopefully in June when session's done. So if things are better and we're back more to normal, I'd certainly look forward to doing that again. I love coming up to Cook County. So, and my wife would move there if she if she could, just so you guys know. <laughs> we'll get you. We'll get you here. <laughs> now, now we know the key too. No, yeah, there, there you go. So, anyway. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody. Unless you have any other questions, I'll get going here. So, thank, thank you, you, Representative. All right. Thank have you. A great day. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye now. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, All right. Um, whoops, I got an echo from uh, there. We go. Thank you, Outer Powers. Um, so here we are on the agenda on letter D of uh, auditor. But what I was going to propose is we take a. Uh, 10 minute, 15 minute break. Um, what, what, what does everyone think? Uh, yes, 10 please. or 15? 10? <laughs> or, or just yes, please? Okay, 10. 10 minute break here. So it's 11.08. Um, let's just break until 11. Uh, well, say let's 11.20. How does that sound? Thank you.
All right. Um, I've got 11.20. Um, looks like we've got our, all of our commissioners back. Attorney Hickens here. Mr. Yorkey Brady, uh, Auditor Powers, are you with us as well? I am. Commissioner Mills. Great. Great. Okay, so okay. Um, oh. we are on item uh, 8D under the auditor, the legal matter, sale of property, vote to close the session. Um, do we have any further questions about that um, or concerns or um, otherwise, um, you know, we can we can make the motion to close the session and, and discuss more of the details that are maybe a little more sensitive? I see no. I see no indicators. So um, I will go ahead and make the motion to enter into a closed session um, in regards to um, the sale of property, in particular of uh, let's say it's described as west 410 feet of the south, 1,070 feet of the northeast quarter, the northwest quarter, except the north 535 feet in section two, township 61. North Range 1 East. And I, I suppose I could have just said parcel ID 53 102 2100. Would have been easier. <clears throat> but it's good to, good to go through the process, right? Um, are there any other uh, details needed in that motion for this to be legit, Attorney Hicken? Okay. No. Thank you. So we have a motion on the table. Is there support? Commissioner Swallison supports. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Um, I'll do a roll call vote here. Commissioner Mills is aye. Uh, Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Okay, I, I see you. It would be good to get a... Aye. There we go. We got it all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins? <coughs> aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. All right, and so... Um, motion passes and um, thank you April for for changing the screen there and so what we need to do now um, commissioners is uh, go into the the invites that attorney Hicken provided for us in the email uh, it could be in your calendar if not in your email box and then click on that link and we'll enter into that separate uh, meeting separate room. meeting room you'll want to you'll want to this meeting I'm sorry, Attorney Hicken. You first want to leave this meeting before you enter the other meeting. Right. Thank you.
All right. I believe we have everyone back here. Let me adjust this mic. Is that adequate? Yep. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess we just open the meeting back up. And um, we're on item 10. A very light item, right? Administrator collective bargaining agreements. And Administrator Yorkie, you're on mute. Of course I am. Okay. So good afternoon now, commissioners. Um, just wanted to go over the details of the three collective bargaining agreements that we uh, have negotiated. And Full, full disclosure, I was not actually on the negotiating team, so I'm going to say what I know uh, about these agreements. Um, there are people on, on the meeting, uh, the two commissioners, Commissioner Mills and uh, Storley, and then also uh, our HR director, Pamela Dixon, was involved in the negotiating sessions, so I'm going to ask them to fill in any blanks that I may leave. Um, but I wanted to talk about sort of the context for the negotiations. Um, so that folks understand kind of where we were coming from and some of the uh, challenges that we encountered in, in going through these discussions. First of all, um, we started negotiating these contracts in the middle of a global pandemic. Well, that's not something that, that we usually do. And there were a lot of uncertainties around that. Um, not the least of which was that we were uh, expecting and we, we were hearing from the state government that there were uh, expected to be massive deficits, both for the current biennium and for the next biennium. And we heard Senator Bach talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, and so we, you know, we started the, the discussions with the expectation that those deficits would, would exist. Um, at the end of last year in December, we got a revised forecast for the current biennium that actually changed the deficit to, I think, a $600 million approximately uh, surplus. And then at the end of last month, as the senator mentioned this morning, um, we learned that we were actually expecting a, a surplus for the next biennium, biennium as well. And so um, as we went into the negotiations in, in the middle of last year, we, we had some real concerns about our financial position uh, going into 2021. And so we started the negotiations uh, proposing that we freeze uh, steps in longevity for all three unions. Um, and we felt that was the prudent thing to do because of all the financial uncertainty. We wanted to make sure that we were able to keep people employed um, and keep the organization afloat financially and felt that uh, putting a freeze on, on steps in longevity was a good strategy to do that. We also expected um, that the contracts would only be for one year because we thought that by the end of that, this current calendar year, we would have more certainty about um, some of those things that were unknown at the time. And so <clears throat> as negotiations moved on, we uh, started getting new information that painted a more optimistic financial picture moving forward. At that point, we uh, decided that we could restore um, steps in longevity pay. And uh, I did uh, get a, a question from a commissioner. Um, all three unions did have longevity as part of their uh, most recent contracts. So. Um, anyway, so we so we moved forward and we were trying to link the um, cost of living adjustment to, to some data point. And there was a lot of discussion about what the consumer price index was. And we, we found that for the upper Midwest region, the 10 year average of the CPI was about 1.6%. Uh, and so we used that as a, as a data point to say, you know, this is what we felt we should be offering for COLA cost of living adjustment. And so um, the first contract that we were able to come to a tentative agreement on was with the CCEA, that's the Cook County Employees Association. Um, and they agreed to that 1.6% COLA. Um, the other two unions wanted to go to mediation. There were unresolved issues. And um, in those mediation sessions, um, we came to an agreement that, a tentative agreement that we would give 
uh, 1% coal adjustment on January 1st of this year, and then another 1% uh, cost of living adjustment on July 1st of this year. So by the end of the year, it would be a total 2% increase. Now, um, we also had the objective of making sure that there was equity across the unions. We wanted it to be as equitable as possible. And so we realized that the CCEA would, would end up 2021 with a 1.6% total increase for the year, where the other two unions uh, were going to have a effectively a 2% 2 .2 increase for the year. And so um, in order to, to uh, again, create equity, we, we uh, are proposing that at the end of 2021, we add another 0.4% uh, to the CCA COLA adjustment for the year before we start negotiating the next three-year contract. That way, all three unions will have gotten effectively a 2% COLA adjustment for 2021. So that's, that's uh, a big part of it. Um, the other notable items, and I'm gonna quickly pull up one moment, please. Okay, so um, the other uh, adjustments that we made as part of these agreements um, was we changed hours of work and premium call-in, call-out pay. So for CCEA, um, there is an additional $1 per hour of call-out pay for the entire shift when called in or when held over to work emergency operations. And those could include things like broken pipes uh, or uh, a tower that, is, uh, that needs attention. Um, we also, um, for the 49ers, which is the highway uh, department union, um, added specific times or regular work hours just to specify what those hours are. Um, and notably, there, there was a double time provision in the 49ers agreement uh, for Sundays and overtime after 12 hours, and we removed those. So that, that is a change for, for this one year agreement. And then for the LELS, which is the law enforcement union, um, we established or we are proposing two hour minimum at overtime rate to attend mandatory meetings on schedule on regularly scheduled days off or improved time off and when told to report to work uh, and then subsequently canceled with less than 24 hours. So those, those are some of the big provisions in terms of hours of work. We also made adjustments to clothing allowance for, for uh, staff who work in the field. Um, that is for all three unions. Um, and then let's see, other key provisions. I think I've talked through most of them already. So, so that's, that's kind of generally where, where the contracts ended up. And I guess I, at this point, I'll, I'll invite uh, Commissioners Mills and Storley and also uh, Director Dixon to, to chime in. Um, thank you, Minister Yorkie. That was a really good summary, especially for not being in, in, the, in the, thick of, the thick, thick of it there. Um, I think you, you have a very good handle of, of what we went through and, and um, where things needed to move and and uh, and how the whole situation changed with news from the state and and whatnot. So um, I don't know that I have uh, any other details I want to bring forward right now. I, 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 well, first first I'd just really like to thank Commissioner Starley and uh, HR Director Dixon for their work uh, in the negotiations because it was. A long process and and difficult and um, significantly out of our experience uh, and, and so um, we all learned a lot and and I think we we did great work and and hopefully setting the stage for our relationship with unions uh, years to come. Um, that's one of my bigger goals is to try to have a. a a more collaborative process uh, between uh, administration and and uh, the unions, um, and 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 between well, th there's legal legal restrictions there, but between unions as well, um, they can't work together legally. <clears throat> but we can um, we can 
agree to meet and, and set um, uh, just you know talk about various aspects that were that we agree to look at um, together and data points um, why we're asking for certain things and, and where that data is coming from and, and I think there's a lot of potential there to to build a better process and, and to build better relationships um, one of the other things I'd, I'd point out is just um, one of Commissioner Storley's concerns, and, and she can speak to this more probably better than, than I, because I wasn't there, was was um, just the process last negotiation round um, and not um, not appreciating this, the situation um, that the board was put in, um, maybe not having enough information ahead of time. And so if, if commissioners, if any of you feel like you don't have enough information or you want some more specifics or details, I will do everything I can to to address that and, and to find that out. Um, and and we just want to make sure we're we're all reading from a similar page here, maybe interpreting things differently, but we, we want to make sure we're all reading from that, that similar page. Um, Commissioner Storley, do you do you want to speak more on that or do you have other other things to, to add? Thank you, Chairman Mills. <clears throat> Well, as you said, we learned an awful lot <clears throat> into this without any past experience. <clears throat> when I think about starting this last summer, <clears throat> as uh, James said, in the middle of a pandemic <clears throat> and spending six months and almost 50 hours, <clears throat> it is, um, I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, we came to an agreement. It was like, you know, the goalposts on a football field, like way out there. And then each time we met, the posts got a little closer and a little closer. They never met, but um, I think we met um, on a good um, level playing field for now. Um, it's most unusual that two commissioners are in union negotiations. But that happened because the other two commissioners were not going to be here the first of the year. So um, I do believe we need to look at the future of a union negotiating team and, um, and come up with, um, with a recommendation on that. Um, but I do feel that, um, that we did uh, as best a job we could and, uh, and we left. Um, with the uh, CCEA <clears throat> uh, and the two mediation experiences, um, with a feeling that you know we did um, we did the best we could with uh, with just the money situation that we were looking at, and so um, I guess the end uh, story of mine is that uh, I feel that we um, we uh, did the best for now. And it'll start all over again in a few months. So uh, you'll have, now you will have the background. <clears throat> you'll have current background where we didn't before. And I think uh, having open communication on this process is really important as, as uh, union negotiations go along. So um, that is, uh, we've left a good track record with that. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. And, and yeah, and it, it, well, one thing I was going to say before before Minister Yorkie is uh, I need to point out that Rena Rogers was was the interim administrator when we started this, and the, mm -hmm. she did a, a great amount of work. Um, and I really need to um, you know give my appreciation to her and her work as well. And then um, both for the the work that she did, and then also so gracefully passing the torch. Um, to Administrator Yorkie uh, for the transition uh, during negotiations, um, it, it was uh, a full team effort, um, and and of course Auditor Powers uh, was involved uh, on the team, but not in the meetings. And and having his perspective of as as we you know since '91 uh, really helped um, helped us and just getting current data and 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 just framing framing the situation so administrator yorkie did you want to add something else well you must have been reading my mind because i was also <laughs> going to acknowledge the uh, the efforts of reno rogers um she 
obviously just lend a lot of uh, thoughtfulness and, and a calm voice to the to the discussions that we were having internally about these negotiations and did a lot of solid work to, to get us where we finally arrived. So I wanna thank her for that publicly. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention, it's my understanding that uh, typically um, the administrator proposes a cost of living adjustment for the management team as well. That is the department directors and administration um, in the interest of keeping the um, keeping equity in the pay table across the organization, I would propose that the, uh, that the MAT, uh, that's the management advisory team, also get a cost of living adjustment that is comparable to the ones that we are giving to 49ers and LELS, which would be 1% effective January 1st and another 1% on July 1st. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Um, Chair. Yes, please. And yes. May I interject, please? Please, please. One one point of clarification or addition, um, in addition to the mat, um, it it would also cover supervisors, so exempt employees or employees not in the unions. Thanks, Pamela. Um, was there anything further you'd like to add um, from just the negotiating perspective, uh, Director Dixon? I think you covered everything that I would say. Um, I would add one more point of clarification for the 49ers contract. The double time um, has for the Sundays and overtime has been removed. Uh, the way that it was removed is a sunsetting MOU. So it, it's not going to be retroactive to January 1st, 2021 um, in effect those two provisions for double time for Sundays and for overtime over 12 hours will be removed as of March 14th of 2021. So uh, because we um, came to that agreement uh, in early March through mediation, we did not want to take away any dollars that would have been paid out to employees prior to that agreement. So we agreed to a sudden setting provision on that particular one. That would be the only thing that I would add. Yeah, and um, again, to make sure that we're all reading from the same page here, I do want to point out that there is still double time, but that is on holidays only. So um, I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. And um, I <clears throat> parity is a huge issue uh, in our organization and, and, and fairness in our community. Uh, for pay. And so um, that was something I was, I was really trying to, to address uh, because if, if one union has double time and others do not, or um, if the standard in our community is time and a half, then, but in our organization, it's double, uh, you know, I just see that as really problematic. And so um, that was something that, that we worked on and um, we made progress there, but it was not uh, complete. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out to make sure we're all aware of that. Um, do commissioners have some questions or concerns or yes, please, Commissioner Swalson. So for clarification purposes, each of the bargaining unit entities with their collective bargaining agreements, they each had a longevity um, portion in each of those. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Be the reason I asked is when I, when I had reviewed the previous CCEA, that one didn't seem to show up. In it. it wasn't in the verbiage and it wasn't down with their pay scales. And things. And so that's why I had brought the question forward because if it was, if this was new coming into this contract, I would have, I would have had a lot more questions as to how that was going to be you know, as a new life. But I'm not surprised that it's in. So I appreciate that. Um, my next question goes, or, or it's a comment. First, I will make a statement though. Thank you so much for the people at the table doing this. I, I've done it for years, many, many, many years. And so I will tell you, even asking questions, I know from being asked questions from my board previously, it always felt a little personal. And I don't mean it to be personal. I honestly don't, having been in your seat. 
Um, the one comment, and I'll make it just as a comment, I'm always protective of penalties to the county. And, and what I mean by that is there's already in labor history and labor negotiations that the time and a half pay, your overtime pay structures, all of those are designed to be penalties against the employer to ensure that you're, you're utilizing that only when it's truly necessary. So, the, and what brings that to mind is the one hour uh, or the $1 additional per hour, that came across to me as an additional penalty. And generally when you're putting those in place, you're doing that because there's a problem. People are being called out indiscriminately. So you're trying to correct that through the additional penalty. So I would only put that out there. I was not at the table, don't know what that discussion was. But um, as we go forward, be watchful of those. The two additional hours of overtime when you're called to a meeting on your day off, that type of thing, I've seen those for years. That's not new, that's not different. That's, that's when you're bringing somebody off of their time, you're gonna pay them at least two hours. That's, that's just general. But that one hour additional, <clears throat> That struck me as something that well, started to border on an additional penalty. And, and only you know whether that was warranted based on our, our own personal performance or how we dealt with those. And my final statement is I was just a little bit surprised with the escalation on the clothing allowance. It, it just seemed like a large change. And, and that one just kind of caught me. Not that that would change with time, but that it, it seemed to have taken a step up. And if there's any comments on those, um, for my better understanding, I, I just appreciate that. Again, thank you so much for your time and your efforts with, uh, with working with the team. Yeah, you bet. And boy, it's great to get your perspective, knowing knowing now your history with, with it. Um, I couldn't really use that in the near future here. Uh, as far as the dollar an hour, you're you're talking about the um, the on call on call pay. Is that? Yeah, it, it appeared in the CCEA contract, um, and and uh, it, it was just it was an adder, and it was in there. And as I say, it struck me as as we were trying to fix something with that, you know, as a penalty towards the county for calling people. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, we 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 identified that as um, as on call pay, and. Um, for example, in the, in the MIS department, IT department, they're one deep there. And so um, there's some challenges there that we cannot address. Um, um, you know, we, we can try to uh, reduce the amount of times that there's a, an actual call out, um, but there's not there's not a whole lot we can do, I think, to um, address the on-call with just that one one deep situation. Um, Chairman contact. Mills, may I interject? Please. Um, the, the dollar an hour additional is for call out pay, and it not is on -call. Sorry, yes, not on you. call, yeah. and it is for emergency uh, purposes only. So similar, I think, in nature to being called out when you're not supposed to be working. Um, this is a situation where you're called out when you're not working, but there's an emergency that you need to handle. Yes, thank you. I was getting my I was getting myself confused. Um, so as as that example in the IT, if we can um, uh, ensure that regular maintenance is done so that less chance of breakage or that kind of thing. That's kind of how we're hoping to build better systems to reduce the call out pay. Um, but otherwise it gets just tricky with limited limited staffing. And yes, we I agree th those are penalties and we want to keep those as low as we can and keep things as predictable as possible. Um, but that was just um, something that we felt needed to be addressed because it there is significant um, call outs, um, and so employees feel that. Um, that's kind of the long and short of that. Um, the the uniform uh, adjustment uh, was the other one that um, that I think is definitely worth um, touching on. And, and that, I think this, the most significant increase was with the 49ers. 
Um, and and the other the other increases I I felt were very easily justified just with knowing what clothing costs and what boots cost, what gear costs. And the 49ers that was uh, a concession for get, eliminating double time and. Um, we tried to weigh that cost with the cost of double time, the uncertainty of double time, the um, the principle of double time, the unfairness, and that sort of thing. And and that's why that one was so much higher. Um, and um, I also think there is just it's justified to increase that one uh, just because of the cost of clothing and boots. But to that extent, uh, was a concession on our part um, for that elimination of double time. And and thank you. And I, I suspected that, um, as I say, it would, you wouldn't call it a negotiation if there wasn't give and take like this. Yeah, and, uh, ooh, we sure learned a lot about, um, well, A, negotiations, B, mediation. That was, that was uh, a fire hose. And then we did learn a little bit of arbitration there uh, in mediation as well. And that influenced uh, my approach to mediation significantly. And, um, and so that's <clears throat> some, of those, um, some of those points um, learned in that I'm hoping to bring to the more proactive side of kind of building that culture and, and collaborative uh, um, just talking about what what needs are and and what what data we can look at to address those needs or or you know how how we can approach this better. So thank you for your questions and very happy to answer more. Um, there was there was you had three and I only touched on two. Um, well, obviously you addressed it uh, uh, well enough because okay. now I know all what it was. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan or, or Commissioner Hawkins, did you have any questions um, regarding the process or any details, any specifics? No. Um, thank you, Commissioner Swallison, for your questions. That we're all answered now. I really appreciate everybody's work on this. I know it can't be easy, but uh, thank you. Yeah. I. I, um, I'm going to disagree a little bit there. I think it can be easy, and that's really what I want to work towards. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this process needs to be contentious. I, I really hope that we can all win from it, the employees, because we want to treat our employees well, right? And we also need to be responsible with county finances and the culture and um, everything. So that's really what I, I want to make it easy, but uh, it wasn't this particular time, and the pandemic didn't help anything there uh, but here we are, and um, the the funniest part, and maybe this isn't funny, but I just want to be clear: all three were ratified by the unions, right? Okay, yeah, that was the, that was the one thing I never actually heard that directly. Um, so I just want to make sure we're we were there, uh, and I assume that since we're talking about it, so. Um, any other comments or questions, Commissioner Storley? Anybody else? Mr. Chair, Mrs. Brady. Powers. Yes, please. Just I, I did some calculations um, based on uh, what what we had looked at previously. Uh, we did calculations with an estimate of 1.6 percent, which is pretty accurate for all of the union contracts, because one and one is actually a little less than that. So with the steps, I just, with that calculation, including the new uh, public information coordinator, which wasn't in the original uh, numbers, uh, the amount of contingency we still have left is just a little more than 50,000. So I think that will be sufficient to cover um, all of the other, the call out pay, the uniform pay, et cetera. Just so you know how that stands with our budget, I don't think we're going to have to go to our fund balance. I think we put enough into the contingency. We may have a little left over. So just so you know that. 
Thank you, Commissioner Salson. And I wanted to thank uh, you know, Brady Powers because that, that, that was my next question is, is I know we had predicted something going in, where did we end up coming out the backside of it? That, that was always a key piece to know, you know, for us and, and you know, for the public, uh, what we planned versus the negotiations and how we came out the other side. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Brady. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> yes, this is just a one-year contract, and um, and uh, I think that was was wise, just because of the situation we're in uh, with the pandemic and and a lot of uncertainty there. I still feel like there is quite a lot of uncertainty, but we'll see what the next round brings. And <clears throat> I think we should have uh, have discussions as a board about how we'd like to to start that. One of the um, one of the tools that was brought uh, forward in mediation was um, the uh, management. What, what was the, the term? Um, Director Dixon, help me. It's uh, labor it's, management committee. La yeah, the LMC labor management committee, and and that's um, seems like a really good way to go. And it sounded like some of the union reps were familiar with them. Maybe not necessarily excited, but I I see it as a good a good place to start um, and to see where that goes. So um, we can we can talk more about that in the future. But, um, but I, I certainly will uh, lean on Commissioner Salson with 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 your experience now um, on the board um, going into the future here. And uh, yeah, I guess. With any, without any other discussion or questions, um, I would I would look for a motion to uh, approve our our CBA um, collective bargaining bargaining agreements. Commissioner Sullivan, I move to approve the collective bargaining agreements for the CCEA, LELS, and the 49ers for 2021. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Is there support? And Commissioner Swallison will support. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? Otherwise, I will do a roll call vote. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. And Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Unanimous approval. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Administrator Yorkie, and thank you, Director Dixon, and, and thank you, Rena Rogers, and thank you, Auditor Powers as well. Boy, it's, did the sun just come out? I thought it might be going down by now. <laughs> Touche. Chairman Mills. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Director Dixon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do we also need to do a vote for the COLA increase for exempt staff who are not in the unions? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Um, do we have uh, a motion uh, to approve the uh, the similar or the same step? Or I'm sorry, cola increases for our exempt employees. Commissioner Swallison makes that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Uh, we have a motion. Is there support? Sullivan supports. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Uh, we have a motion and support. Is there any other discussion? Hearing or seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Swallison? Aye. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Hawkins? Aye. Commissioner Storley? Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. Unanimous approval there. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Director Dixon, for that reminder. Now the sun can come out. Yeah, <laughs> it did go behind the cloud or it was setting or something, and now it's out again. <laughs> um, 
now we're on to uh, item 10B, administrator updates. Administrator Yorkey. So just, just a couple of big things uh, that I want to update you on. One is that I'm working on the presentation for next week's Committee of the Whole meeting on our um, building fund. And <laughs> the, more, the more information I uncover and the more I learn, the more questions I have. Um, so not to get too much into the details yet, but I think any, any of you who've been around for more than a few years and have been paying attention know that there's been a lot of activity around um, proposed new construction. Um, we developed a financial management plan back in 2017 that assumed the construction of some new major facilities and uh, also assumed that, some, that we would do some bonding for those. Uh, those did not move forward. And so right now we're, um, we haven't really updated that, that financial management plan as far as the building fund goes. And so there are a lot of questions that we, that we need to be looking at. Um, and so what I'll be doing next week is kind of giving you an overview of our building portfolio, talking about um, the, the history of, of our building maintenance and the building fund, how we have or haven't funded uh, building upkeep and then pose some questions in terms of a future direction for us. And there's, there's some information that I think we're gonna need to collect to, to start to bring into focus how, where we need to go. Um, we, you know, we, when we last uh, talked about new buildings, this was before the pandemic, um, and the fact that we're working uh, for the most part remotely right now, um, really creates some opportunities to, to reimagine the way we use uh, existing spaces. And so that's something that we're going to have to uh, take a harder look at. And uh, I'll be talking more about that next week. So pretty much every waking moment that I have these days, I'm just thinking about buildings. So um, look, look forward to that presentation next week. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, you all heard um, that the Senate approved the um, American uh, re, what is it, ARP, the, um, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on it right now. What, what is the R? It's, uh, well, anyway, the new stimulus bill, let's just call it that. Um, okay. Anyway, um, it, so it was approved by the Senate, of course, it's expected to be approved by, by the House and, and signed into law by the President. Um, the National Association of Counties was, uh, doing some projections on what counties might expect to receive. Um, and for Cook County, that projection was just slightly north of a million dollars. And so um, I'm tracking that very closely and uh, trying to understand, you know, where those dollars are going to go um, and kind of how, what steps we'll need to take to make sure that they're spent in accordance with, with uh, Congress's intentions. So. Um, a lot of work will be happening around that, and I'll have more updates as, as I learn more about that. So those are kind of the big things that I'm focusing on right now, and uh, always lots of smaller things, fires to put out and whatnot, um, but uh, really enjoying the work and really grateful for the, uh, for the assistance that I'm getting um, and the support from, from this board and also from, from all of our staff and folks in the community. Uh, a lot of great work going on. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, very much looking forward to, to more discussions on the on the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's see, it looks like we can move on to item 11 here on our agenda, employee concerns, commissioner concerns. Uh, first one is commissioner reports. Do we have any, any commissioners uh, wanting to report on anything today? Chairman Mills. Commissioner Storley. Yes, just briefly, I attended um, my first AMC coffee, which is always the first Wednesday of the month at 8 a.m. I could only stay for about 50 minutes because I had another meeting, but it was um, just really nice. It was very relaxed and many different topics, but one topic that did take some attention was um, Julie um, kind of throwing out the idea of where are we going to go, you know, the rest of the year with the pandemic and restriction of travel and so forth. But um, she's highly hoping that maybe we can have our uh, conference in December. So that was um, much <laughs> received by those of us who were visiting. 
um, that we really hope that we can get together. So um, that was um, a good conversation and, and uh, they're doing this, I think through um, May. So it's a fun thing to join. Nice, great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Hawkins, you had your hand up as well. I guess I just wanted to report the M Club met last Thursday and we authorized a study to be done looking at state acquired pilt lands and all of the counties, there's 10 counties in N Club now, um, have a concern that state payments are not keeping up in relation to values. So I personally don't hold a lot of confidence that we're gonna change anything at the state level, but there is consensus among the group that we should at least do the work of figuring it out and presenting the data to our legislature. So just a heads up, hopefully that report will be completed by fall. Thank you. No, that's that's great to hear, and um, and that's that for anything to happen at the state, that type of work is needed to happen. So thank you for for your involvement there. Um, and we can all we can do is is build a good case and try. So thank you. Um, any other commissioner reports? Oh, Commissioner Sullivan. I just wanted to uh, mention that the North Shore Scenic Drive Council um, met this past month to review and add supporting and contributing organizations like the Gunflint Trail Scenic Byway. They've also added the Cook County Historical Society and um, hopefully those organizations will be able to benefit some, from some grants they've received. So that was very, very positive. Thank you. All right, um, moving on here, um, we have uh, meeting updates, meetings to note. Um, item 12 is uh, correspondence and memos. There's both the lodging tax and the EDA board packet in there. Otherwise, item 13 is the recognition of staff. Uh, and we do have the resignation of Michaela um, from Soil and Water. And um, um, she'll be sorely missed there. Um, excellent, excellent employee and, and has helped many people in, in the county here. Um, but wishing her the best as she as she moves along in her career. And uh, otherwise, we have March anniversaries. Courtney Benier in the auditor's office, 27 years. Olivia Bonander, uh, PHHS, for two years. Warren Hagen, the highway, 15 years. Bill Lane in land services, 15 years. Um, Jeffrey Mork, attorney's office, one year. Teresa Oberg in soil and water, 11 years. Randy Roberts, the highway department, three years. Mina Rogers, MIS, seven years. And Amanda Weberg in soil and water um, for just one year here. Thank you all for, for your work and, and keeping us going and keeping us on track and really appreciate all you do. Happy anniversary. Um, Looking for a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Hawkins. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, is there support? Starley support. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins. Aye. Commissioner Starley. Aye. Commissioner Swalson. Aye. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Mills is aye as well. We have unanimous approval to adjourn. Thank you, everyone.